Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. Dubois. Topic of news at 5.30. A bizarre altercation at a pizzeria in Suffolk County brings shocking allegations and a strong denial of wrongdoing. CBS 2's Tony Aiello with details and reaction. And he stumped me in my face again, and then he, then he made a racial slur. I don't want to say it on the air. I don't want to do that. Willie Marshall says it was the most shocking thing in his life. A visit last Saturday to Paisano Pizza in Greenlawn that ended with an injury to his eye and his wife Alfie with blood on her shirt and shoes and an injury to her head too graphic to show on TV. We don't deserve this and nobody else deserves this either. The Marshalls say it all began when they complained about their two slices of pizza. They claim the men at the counter, brothers Frank and Michael Maringolo, mocked them, threw a salt or pepper shaker at Mrs. Marshall, hit Mr. Marshall, and used ugly language. The allegations as they appear to be that one of the employees had said, this is for Obama. Damn you, Obama. You tell me what that means. The pizzeria employees were charged with misdemeanor assault. When I visited, they referred me to their lawyer, who read from a statement. The allegation by Mr. and Mrs. Marshall that the incident on November 24th was, quote, a racial attack or an Obama backlash, close quote, is completely untrue. The employees claim Willie Marshall initiated the altercation. He says he was peaceful until he saw his wife was injured. As I was going out the door, it was some cheers standing there. And quite naturally, when I saw the blood, I got very angry and I kicked the chairs. The marshals may file a lawsuit. Their church is planning a peaceful protest march at the pizzeria next week. In Greenlawn, Suffolk County, Tony Aiello, CBS 2 News. At first, the DA did not classify the incident as a biased crime, but just minutes ago, prosecutors announced they are referring the case back to Suffolk County Police for further investigation. I got another thing that's on the field. And the whole one. supremacy. Justice Gusty Renegade, in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information about the system of racism, white supremacy. Today's date, Sunday, April 27th, 2014. So I have been told uh, we should be back on Tuesday, uh, in fact, we should have two programs on Tuesday. However, neither program will be at our normal broadcast time because both of our guests for Tuesday uh, are outside the states. Uh, we should have a black male from the area of the world known as South Africa. They have major elections uh, popping up, and uh, I think it would be great to get more detail. Uh, we also have a white male racist suspect coming on the program. He is in the United Kingdom. I think this will be the first time we are having two guests on the same day from different parts of the world, I think. 
I know this is not the first time we've had two programs with one of the guests in South Africa, but global system, even the program today, globally, I think this would certainly apply to black people, non-white people, anywhere in the known universe. Um, the broadcast today, I think uh, Bruce Fine and Pam, Trojan Horse Publications, Pam, uh, racismws.com, visit the website. But uh, I think Bruce Fine found the information about our guest and uh, the book we're going to talk about today and she passed it along to Pam who wrote a blog post about it and uh, they both thought it would be really great uh, for non-white people to think about how the system of racism uh, is at work on your very fork um, and I agree <laughs> um, in fact we have talked about what we put in our mouths and how that is connected to racism, white supremacy before um, on several programs. Uh, we're going to talk about it in terms of the importance of eating a healthy diet, fruits, vegetables, uh, just how much of an awesome counter racist effort would be. Would it be uh, for black people to be eating vegetarian, vegan, a more plant based diet, uh, which huge impact against racism, white supremacy right there. But the other thing that you can keep in mind, that sound clip at the beginning, uh, I hope folks remember that, right? The uh, Papa John's down in Sanford, Trayvon Martin, Florida, where this white guy accidentally called, and it was a black couple, right, that he's, that he's delivered to. He accidentally called them and recorded himself uh, making all of these blatantly racist comments and uh, I think this is important just for so many reasons this was a young white guy this was not Clive and Bundy this was not Frazier Glenn Miller this was a young white guy uh, definitely under 25 I think uh, who delivering yummy tasty Papa John's pizza to a black family and this is what you hear now this is the person that's delivering the food as Minister Malcolm X said, I mean, you would be crazy to go to Clive and Bundy and ask him to feed your family. Sadly, many of us are doing that every day all around the world. The other clip that you heard within that, that was just the, the singing on the bookends, right? The other clip uh, I had almost forgotten about. That happened in 2012 where a black couple, male, female, they go to this pizzeria and end up being physically assaulted. Uh, he reported because the owner was upset about President Obama. I'm not surprised about that at all, given how regularly I see that. But this just happened to a black couple in a pizzeria, and I could have went on and on and on. The incident from last summer with a black family, they went to uh, some sort of wing restaurant, and uh, they asked, and it was, I think, like 25 of them, and they asked the family to leave because a white person was uncomfortable sitting next to those black people. She must know Donald Sterling. That was just last summer. Uh, I think summer of 2013 that we talked about that. And people called in with their own incidents. This is every day. Every day. This goes on. Remember, I mean, the one from last summer, it happened right after Trayvon Martin. And they connected it to the Trayvon Martin case because uh, it was a black female who works for NPR. And she said there was another black female in the line at some sub sandwich place. And the person making the food, she said the person making the food was making comments about how ugly she was and about her hair. This was a black female and the black uh, female who was reporting this said that she looked like Rachel Gentel. I don't know if people remember that, but I played the audio segment on this program. They spent a good chunk of time talking about it. And they said just and it stuck in my mind because they connected it to the Trayvon Martin trial. But and I, we talked about that. We talked about the insanity of that. <clears throat> and I said the accurate, correct response to that is thank you for telling me I must have bumped my head. Let us both exit this restaurant immediately, all of the black, and make sure that we alert all of the black people on the way out to never set foot in that restaurant again. I don't need a toothpick. I don't even want to use your bathroom. That is the other aspect that you can think about, all of the information that you're going to get. Like, there are multiple reasons 
to really be vigilant about what goes on your plate, what goes in your shopping basket, what you put in your child's mouth. That has a huge impact, and racist white supremacists do a lot of damage in that area. Uh, our guest for today's broadcast has a fantastic book uh, addressing this matter, and I think just by the title, she is connecting this to racism, white supremacy, uh, the book by any greens necessary. Hmm. She was inspired by uh, one of our former guests, uh, Mr. Dick Gregory. Uh, she heard him giving a lecture, giving information uh, about the importance of eating correctly. Uh, we'll hear about how some of her travels on the continent uh, and just being around other black people that she had to kind of help with this whole transition, uh, what impact that had on her eating habits and why this is something that uh, black people should uh, seriously consider and think about uh, what we do to ourselves, the damage that we inflict on our own self and health uh, with our forks every day. A uh, real pleasure to have her on the program. Joining us live, our guest, uh, Miss Tracy Lynn McWhorter, PMPH. Let me nab her line really quick. Miss uh, McWhorter, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you for having me. The pleasure is ours. I know uh, Bruce Fine, I think several of our guests who are familiar with your work, they were just super excited, as am I, uh, to get more information. And they really feel like you have uh, just outstanding uh, material that uh, every black person should have in their home and really make sure that they're checking out the outstanding work that you're doing. So the pleasure is all ours. Um, Thank you. For sure. Um, I guess for folks who do not know about By Any Greens Necessary and uh, the work that you do, uh, whatever you think folks need to know about you before we get started. Well, I um, my book is called By Any Greens Necessary, and the subtitle is A Revolutionary Guide for Black Women Who Want to Eat Great, Get Healthy, Lose Weight, and Look Fat, and that's P-H-A-T fat, obviously. Uh, of course, and um, my book is a vegan manifesto. It's a manifesto for eating healthier plant-based foods, and it targets African-American women in particular. And um, so I have a master's degree in public health nutrition from, from New York University. Um, I, I uh, went to Amherst College, and my undergrad degree is in uh, African-American studies and political science. And I um, have been doing work around, um, you know, promoting healthy eating for a variety of reasons for um, about 20, 25 years. Um, I've been vegan almost 30 years. So this is, this is kind of an accidental career, as I'm sure we'll get into, but something that, I, that I, has changed the course of my life. And... Um, is the work that I do because I believe that this is something that we have complete control over and we must take control over our health starting with our plate. Amen. Amen. Um, folks can visit the website to get more information about Miss McWhorter and the book, uh, where she's going to be at. You can check her out. Uh, the website, Buy Any Greens Necessary. Dot com right mm -hmm. by any greens necessary dot com uh, should be linked if you're listening at Black Talk Radio Network. Uh, but the address again, if you are not there, by any greens necessary dot com. Uh, you are a black female, Miss McCorder. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Uh, this program uh, we use the terms racism and white supremacy as synonyms. Uh, I'm of the belief that we do have a global problem on this planet, uh, racism, white supremacy. The definition I use for both terms is as follows, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you think such a system exists, and do you think that definition is accurate? Yes. 
Wow. <laughs> Love it. The concise. <laughs> yes. Right on. OK, though. Um, let's see. I guess to kind of to kind of get started, um, let's go right there. You said this was an accidental career. Um, you start your book off talking about how you were not born or, or raised in a household that was uh, strictly vegetarian, like you did get some access to, I guess, junk food and such when you went to school, even though you, you kind of had to grapple with your mom about eating your vegetables um, at night, that uh, you went off to college, like a lot of people got into a lot of bad foods, gained weight, and you heard Dick Gregory? Yeah, exactly. So um, my mother was my mother. So I was I was raised. I was uh, born in 1966. So growing up, um, you know, at that time, my mother was health conscious for her for that time, and you know, the, the late 60s and 70s, early 80s. So we didn't have a cookie jar. We didn't have um, a, you know, we didn't have a lot of sweets around. We we ate total cereal. Um, we ate uh, skim milk. We had whole wheat bread. You know those kinds of things. Those kinds of changes my mother had already made. So she planted these seeds early on. Um, we ate this way, but the thing is, is that we didn't really like it. <laughs> so um, school was my refuge because it was kind of all you can eat. Uh, it was an all you can eat kind of cafeteria, and I loved sweets and desserts and, and all of that, and so I just gorged while I was at school. And um, I actually had two teachers who were vegetarian. I went to Sidwell Friends School in D.C., um, and uh, a lot of people know this school because that's now where the Obama girls are going. At the time, and I went there third through 12th grade, so at the time, there was no vegan, you know, offering there. Um, and two of my teachers in seventh grade were vegetarian, and they wanted our class camping trip to be vegetarian, and I thought this was a horrible idea, and I wrote a petition to protest it, and I got a few of my classmates to sign it, but I was overruled by my teachers, and so we had a vegetarian camping trip, and I just thought it was crazy, didn't give it a second thought, fast forward seven years, and I'm a sophomore now at Amherst College. And our Black Student Union brought Dick Gregory to campus to talk about the state of black America. So we knew Dick Gregory as a uh, civil rights icon, uh, a comedian, humorist. Um, we did not know that he was at that time, in the, this was 1986, championing, champion, championing a vegetarian diet. Um, so... He decided to flip the script on us and talk about the plate of black Americans and how unhealthfully most black folks eat, how unhealthfully most people in America eat, but in particular um, African Americans. So I thought back to my two seventh grade teachers and I was like, okay, the Gregory is crazy too. I tried to tune him out and what really grabbed me about his talk was when he started tracing the path of a hamburger from a cow on a factory farm through the slaughterhouse process to a fast food restaurant to a clogged artery to a heart attack. And he traced it very graphically. And he spoke for about two and a half hours. And I was stunned. I had never heard anything like that before in my life. So, um... I immediately gave up hamburgers and hot dogs, and that lasted for about a week, and then I was, you know, I said, he's crazy, but he, he planted a seed, and I had to find out if what he was saying was true. Now, my freshman year, the year before he came, he came during my sophomore year, my freshman year, I had gained 25 pounds because I was away from home and eating whatever I wanted, so I do believe I was on the path to a very unhealthy life had he not decided to change his topic. Um, so I, um, I went home a few months later and I decided to read everything that I could about vegetarianism in the library and by the, and my mother and one of my sisters read the same books and by the end of the summer we decided that, you know, what he was saying was true and we became vegetarian. And, uh, do you want me to continue and, and talk about what happened in Kenya and, and at Howard? Oh, wow. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, 
so uh, that that happened. That reading and that change happened um, during the summer after my sophomore year. Oh, I, I should also say that one of the reasons that um, I was open to hearing Dick Gregory's message at that time is that I was questioning a lot of things in my life. So I was taking a lot of uh, classes, you know, as, as uh, African American studies and, and political science major. So I was learning about things that I had never learned about at Sidwell, like um, racism and sexism, this false notion of white supremacy, third world imperialism, homophobia, capitalism, sexism, all of these things I was learning about really for the first time, and it was just changing my entire paradigm. So I was also open to questioning the way that the society dictated that I should eat. And uh, so that was the, I took the relaxer out of my hair. So that was the context in which I heard his talk. So the following year, I was taking my junior year away, and I was going to Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya for the first semester, and uh, Howard University for the second semester. So when I arrived in Nairobi, I had uh, applied for the program a year before when I was a very content omnivore, but I showed up as a new vegetarian. I hadn't given up cheese yet. And they would not change the menu for me. So I had to eat, the, you know, the omnivore food, the meat and dairy-based food that they serve. So um, this trip to Kenya I took because I had never, you know, I wanted to have a, a black experience for really the first time in my life. So that's why I chose Kenya and then Howard for my entire junior year. And so um, it, going to Nairobi, Kenya was absolutely a fantastic experience. You know, arriving on the soil, I cried as we were landing the plane. I mean, it was fantastic. It was a beautiful experience. And part of that experience was living with Sam Bruce for two weeks, traveling with them. And um, part, they're camel herders. And so uh, part of what they do um, is drink the milk of camels and, and you know, and, and they eat meat. So um, they eat goat. And so one night we were climbing up a mountain cave um, with Sambu elders and 30 students. I, I happen to be the only black student among these 30 students. Wow. wow. Um, yeah. So, mm. but, the, but, the, but all of the families that we, the different types of families that we stayed with all asked me over for dinner. I mean, they seldom saw black students in this program. And so I was treated like a lot of lost cousin or daughter. It was wonderful. Um, Can I so pause we right got there, to really go, Can I pause just sure. for the emphasis? Uh, you said that you were treated so well, you were treated like a mm -hmm. daughter uh, because they don't often see black students in the study abroad program? Exactly, so exactly. I, am I to take it that most of the students participating in this program are white? Yes. Wow. I just want, just for emphasis, because that's a point that comes up on this program a lot about white people being ignorant about racism and black people. Just thought that was very important. I apologize for the interruption. Please proceed. Oh, no. No, that's okay. <laughs> no, that's, no that's, that was definitely part of the experience that I, you know, that I had being in Africa, but being one, but being the only black student of 30 students. Um, there was one student who um, had an Asian parent um, and a white parent, I believe, but I was the only black student. So we climb up this mountain cave and we bring two goats with us. And the night before, I had seen a goat being born for the first time with the Sambu family we were living with. And um, so we, so Sambu kill the goat by slitting its throat. And then they drink the blood and they asked us to do that. Um, and then they skinned the animal and chopped it up and made goat stew. And I had never seen this process before. And, you know, having read about vegetarianism for the whole summer previously, I, um, you know, I was shocked. And so, you know, I was like, I'm not going to eat the food, I'm not going to eat the food. But then I did. It was smelling really good and I ate it. But I felt guilty because the other goat was tethered to a tree 
and we were eating in front of it, and I wondered if it knew what had happened to its companion. So I made this connection for the first time. Um, and then the last night of our uh, travel with the Sambu, part of that travel was going on safari. And so we went to this restaurant called The Carnivore, where they actually, at that time in 1986 and 7, served the animals that were killed on safari. And so they brought out this antelope-looking creature that had been roasted whole over a pit and put it on the table in front of us and started carving it. And it was intact from head to tail, eyes, everything. And it was like a person. And, I, and, I, and that was the moment that I said, I can't do this anymore. Um, it was a very visceral experience. So I had that experience. It did not take away from my experience being in Kenya and, you know, being with Sambu and, and, and uh, spending that whole six months there. It was a fabulous time. But those particular things affirmed for me that I was going to be vegetarian again when I returned. So I went to Howard the second semester, and I lived at home with my mother because I'm from D.C., and I was thrilled to discover that there was a thriving black, vegan, and vegetarian community right up the street from Howard that had been, that started the very first all vegetarian, I'm sorry, let me correct that, the very first all vegan health food stores, cafes, and carryouts in the nation's capital in the early 1980s. And I did not know that they were there, you know, growing up in D.C. I had no idea. So I immersed myself in this community. I learned everything that I could about where to shop, how to make it affordable, how to make it delicious. Um, I took cooking classes with my mom. We shopped together. We, we created recipes. And this was my, this really was my entree into vegetarianism and veganism through black folks who had been, many of them had been influenced by Dick Gregory. And I'm sure as many of your readers know, he wrote Cooking with Mother Nature back in 1974. And that was his uh, plant-based manifesto, and that became a Bible of sorts for people all over the country. And many of these folks in this community around Howard were also influenced by their participation in the civil rights movement and the black liberation movement to become vegetarian and vegan, to take control over their health as part of the liberation struggle. And so this is how I entered vegetarianism and veganism. Um, and so when people ask, and so I always say this because um, I want people to understand that we have been doing this. We have been eating this way. This is part of our tradition for a very long time. Dick Gregory learned about vegetarianism from a naturopathic doctor named Alvinia Fulton who started the first health food store on the south side of Chicago in the 1950s. Um, and she led detoxes with civil rights uh, leaders and um, members during the civil rights struggle. So this is this has always been for us alongside of social of all the other so, social justice movements and activities that we were participating in and leading. And so I will pause there. Wow. Outstanding. Uh, again, the address, uh, you can visit the website by any greens necessary dot com. Uh, joining us live on the context of white supremacy. Miss Tracy Lynn McWhorter. Um, wow, so much, uh, so much great information. I guess one thing that I wanted to kind of go back and touch on, because I think this is uh, very important, and I think it's actually uh, has another question right as a follow up as well. But uh, you talked about how after you heard uh, Dick Gregory uh, and him kind of planting this seed for you thinking about being more mindful about what you put in your mouth, what you put on your plate. You went back and you talked to your mom, who already uh, had some consciousness about the importance of diet. And you were talking to her about, hey, you know, maybe we should think about uh, being vegetarian, being vegan. And you all went and kind of researched this together to see, you know, is Dick Gregory crazy? Or should we really, you know, maybe be implementing what he's talking about? And 
uh, you go and uh, with your mom and she's willing to go and research and read and you all come back and talk about this. Can you talk about the impact of having, I mean, your mom, that's not just like a friend, but I mean, just <laughs> having another black person there uh, with you who you're, you all are researching together and sharing the enthusiasm mm -hmm. and how that can help you make that change. Yes, and, and my middle sister as well, um, who, was, who was in college at the time. But yes, definitely. So it was crucial for us that we had each other. Uh, the three of us were, our, were each other's support system, for sure. And the, the fabulous thing is that my mother was open. Uh, as I said, she, she had health, some health consciousness already. Um, but, you know, she was in her 50s at the time, and she's from Camden, South Carolina. So this is no small feat for her to decide to go vegan, to go vegetarian, and then a year later go vegan. Um, and so, um, but again, my mother, this is not a surprise to me because of who my mother is. The, the, my feminism, my activism, my brilliance, my boldness my confidence, all of that for me and my two sisters are a direct result of my mother's influence. So, you know, the fact that, that she would hear this, you know, hear me talking about this lecture, have already had some consciousness about eating healthier, you know, um, and decide that she wants to investigate this with me is, is not something that surprised me at all. The, and so she became, you know, after doing the reading herself and, and, and having these conversations about these books we were reading that summer, we all decided to, to become vegetarian and then to become vegan. Now, my mother was the only one in her circle who was doing this. My mother today is 77 years old. 27 years later, she is still vegan. She still has her hourglass figure. She has... No health issues whatsoever, no high blood pressure, no high cholesterol, no arthritis, no diabetes, no overweight. And she exercises six days a week for one to two hours a day. So she is a living example of what eating plant-based foods along with exercising can do. And not only that, but my mother is one of 14 siblings. So of those siblings who have survived into their senior year, she is the only one who has no chronic disease issue. And both of her parents died of chronic disease. So she has changed that entire paradigm for her generation um, of, of our family. And so I tell people that it's not, it, it really is the diet. That it's, you know, there's a saying that, that, that your DNA can load the gun, but it's the diet that pulls the trigger, for lack of a better um, uh, example, analogy. But that is definitely true. You may be predisposed, but your diet will determine whether something manifests. Um, and my mother is a living example of that. So at 77 years old, she'll be 78. She looks 20 to 30 years younger, and she's very fit and healthy. And if that's not a testimony, I, you know, I don't know what else there is. Mm. Wow. Ashe for mommy. Um, <laughs> what, and that, the follow up to that question was for a lot of black people, I could hear them saying that they don't have that sort of support system where they don't have other uh, close black family members or friends. Uh, to say, yeah, I also want to make this change. Like I've heard from a lot of people that, you know, they would kind of be doing this, um, maybe not even just on their own, but doing it in the face of opposition from others saying, you are crazy. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. how are you going to, how are you going to get all your nutrition or, you know, forget nutrition. I just like eating, you know, a hamburger or a steak or a prime rib or ribs or whatever the case may be, uh, doing it in the face of a lot of, uh, opposition and maybe even mocking from other black family members and friends. Yeah, you know, it, it used to be that way, um, you know, tw nearly 30 years ago, 27 years ago when we started. Um, definitely in our family, we got teased a lot because we have a huge family and we all got together for Thanksgiving every year, and we still do. And in the beginning, we got a lot of teasing, a lot of ribbing. But over the years, as uh, especially older members of our family um, they started to have health issues, um, 
they began to question. Um, they began to quest. They began to question their own diet and ask us for advice, particularly my mom. So now, and you know, and back then, people didn't even know what the word vegan meant. And now, everyone knows somebody who's vegetarian or vegan. And it's not like, oh, I could never give up meat. It's uh, I don't eat that much meat. That's usually the first thing that people say. So times have definitely changed in these last three decades. That's number one. Um, number two, it's a lot easier to be vegan now than it was 30 years ago. There's so many more um, options at restaurants everywhere and so many more uh, convenience foods for people who want to transition. So, uh, and there are a lot of meetup groups now. In, in uh, most major cities, there are black vegetarian groups and societies in cities across the country. They're now, as of 2000, uh, what's the latest statistic? As of 2012, there were an estimated 3 million African American vegetarians, which includes vegans. So there really are more than people may think, uh, folks who are doing this and folks who are committed to helping others and supporting others. So I recommend that people actually go online and look up the vegetarian societies that are in their cities. And if there's not a black vegetarian group and there's a predominantly white group, there's likely to be a black group within that group um, or black, and or black members. So it is a lot easier now. Um, and, you know, I do get the, you know, oh, I could never do that kind of deal, um, as if, you know, eating fried chicken as a birthright or uh, having macaroni and cheese as a, as a birthright, you know. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a, you know, I'm 30 years in at this point, so I'm not self-righteous like I used to be in the very beginning. And I have a lot of, uh, compassion and patience and, and remembering of how it was for me, it was challenging. And so I just tell people to start where they are. And I tell people that they don't have to defend their diet. They don't expect their relatives to defend their diet, so why should they defend their diet? And I tell people to never talk about it at the dinner table because that's not the place to talk about feces on chicken and other things like that that people may not want to hear about why you have changed your diet um, or, you know, what happens to your arteries and, you know, and, and all of that kind of stuff. So talk about it at another time. Talk about it later. Send them resources, you know, that kind of thing. But don't feel like you have to be the evangelist at every moment. And um, so uh, those are kind of some tips I, 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 I offer people. But absolutely, reach out for a support system. There are likely to be vegetarian groups already existing in your community. Mm, phenomenal. I really hope people uh, were paying attention uh, to, uh, you said call you Tracy, is that? <laughs> yeah, please. Mm -hmm. um, the great response uh, that we got from Tracy, because um, I think that gets, I have said something very similar uh, in going out to talk about racism, uh, you should kind of take the same approach. Uh, people don't necessarily want to be preached to all the time and kind of waiting for them to uh, inquire uh, and to ask questions uh, to show that they're receptive and they want to hear what you have to say. Um, that outstanding. Um, what would your what would your response be to black people who say, yeah, I want to make this transition. Uh, I know, you know, eating healthful foods is very important. But Whole Foods, you know, it really uh, takes too much green out of my wallet. Uh, eating healthy right. can be really pricey. <laughs> and you, you even talk about how some of that is systemic because of what gets subsidized and what doesn't. Uh, what would your response Absolutely. be? Well, that's definitely true. I mean, there's a reason why, um, you know, processed and packaged food and junk food, sweets, snacks are, are cheaper um, because they are subsidized. The food industry um, is the largest industry in this country. And of the and advertising, food advertising is the largest chunk of advertising that exists in this country. And most of the food that's advertised, more than 70% of it, is for processed foods, snack foods, junk foods, candies, that kind of thing. And so what do most of us eat in this country? Those foods. So it's all by design. Uh, the United States Department of Agriculture tells us 
what we should eat as a nation now using my plate. You know, it used to be the food that I pyramid. But their other task is to uh, make sure that the food industry is profitable. So they will never tell us not to eat a certain food, despite the fact that that food can lead to chronic disease, illness, and early death. And so that's the, that's the conflict of interest that most people don't know exists with the United States Department of Agriculture, which is why we have to take our health into our own hands once we know this. So they subsidize the food industry to make this food cheap um, so that we will buy the food. This is part of making this country um, profitable. So um, there are ways to... So that's why it's, you know, it's cheap to get Hamburger Help or Wonder Bread or packaged macaroni and cheese, that kind of thing, as opposed to getting organic produce that's $3 for a bunch. So what I tell people to do, Whole Foods and, and uh, stores like that definitely are expensive, but there are ways to make eating healthy, um, healthful foods less expensive. For example, um, if you eat... If you like uh, lentils, uh, lentil stew, or black bean burritos, or tacos, or chili, you know, anything that you might use beans or lentils or split peas with as your plant-based of, plant base of, of protein, my suggestion to people is to buy the beans, the nuts, the lentils, the split peas in the bulk bin, from the bulk bin. And usually, if you buy a half a cup or a cup or even two cups, it's going to be anywhere between 50 cents and $2. And you will get the same amount of protein that you would get from a piece of uh, ground beef or a piece of chicken. The, the, the deal is that you don't get the saturated fat and the cholesterol that can clog your arteries and lead to chronic disease when you get it from plant-based sources like beans. But when you get it from uh, meat and dairy, you also get saturated fat and cholesterol with that protein. It's a, it's a package deal. So it can be cheaper to get your protein from plant-based sources, and obviously it's healthier. So um, if, you, if you shop the bulk bins for your beans, for your whole grains, for your oats, for your, even for your breakfast cereals, your granola. It's cheaper than getting packaged food from the store. Now, you can have the same foods using plant-based ingredients. So I eat quiche, I eat pancakes, I eat waffles, I eat cookies, I eat pie, I eat um, all kinds of things. Stews, I even have macaroni and cheese using um, non-dairy ingredients. Um, plant-based ingredients. So you can have all of the foods that you're familiar with, just use healthful plant-based ingredients, and they can be cheaper. If you shop the bulk bins and um, you kind of steer clear of whole foods unless they're having a sale and you shop the co-ops or the farmer's markets. Mm. And, of course, if you grow your own uh, vegetables and fruit, if you're able to do that, that's, that's the number one option, and that's the cheapest of all. And also, when you shop the bulk, then you want to get all your grains from there. So your your whole grains, your brown rice, your black rice, quinoa, um, corn, millet, amaranth, uh, all of these whole grains, you want to get those from the bulk bin, and, they're, and they can be cheap as well, cheaper than getting a package like Uncle Ben's. <laughs> all right. <laughs> that... Uh... <laughs> The racism is so ubiquitous. I mean, it just pops up. Uh, anyway, um, that is... Yeah, a- exactly. <laughs> That's the whole conversation. You're right. <laughs> you uh, are absolutely right. Um, that I also thought was an outstanding point when I lived in uh, California. Uh, I had been eating vegetarian when I lived in uh, Georgia. And then when I went to California, I kind of transitioned and got uh, to vegan uh, for several years. And... Um, never on the plantation time that I've been here have I had access to tons of finances so I can never just go to the grocery store and be mindless about spending but I actually used Mm -hmm. to shop at Whole Foods uh, regularly like that was my weekly grocery uh, shopping store not that I was balling like all the other white people that were there but if you're buying in bulk and you're staying away from a lot of the package stuff you're just getting going directly to the produce 
you can shop at Whole Foods. I'm not saying you got to shop there, but I mean, even that can be not too expensive uh, if you are using, because uh, they have bulk of, in a lot of stuff. You can get bulk uh, grains, as you mentioned, and olive oil, a lot of uh, pretty much everything that you can use in the kitchen, a lot of, or I would say a lot of the things. Um, you can yeah. get in bulk and save a lot of money. Um, Absolutely. You can get all of your spices in bulk mm-hmm. um, at Whole Foods. And then, you know, you're a bunch of kale or a bunch of collards or mustard greens or um, spinach. It's $3 organic. Mm-hmm. That's $3. You know, that's not, that. you know, that can be relative. You know, you might spend $3 on a bag of, of uh, organic potato chips. And that's not healthy, you know, or a bag of Doritos or a pack of Doritos if you go to Costco or something. Um, So it's relative as well. You know, $3 and a bunch of dark leafy greens, which is the healthiest food you can eat other than fruit, is worth worth it to me. So, you know, it's relative. You can get produce that's, um, that's not that expensive. And you can shop from the bulk bin at stores like Whole Foods in addition to the to the co-ops and the health food stores and the farmer's market. So um, I have a whole chapter about how to make it um, affordable in the book. And so um, it's, it's definitely doable. I agree. Uh, if there are folks out there uh, who are listening who have questions, uh, you'd like to ask Tracy, uh, the number to dial is 760-569-569. 7676 and the code is 564-943-POUND. Uh, press star 6 if you have questions you would like to ask. Uh, don't wait till the last minute. Um, we have a lot of parents who listen to the program as well and you do talk in your book about how uh, you have a sister uh, who has a four, well the book was in 2010 so I guess she's seven now. Uh, your niece, yeah, she's eight. Mm-hmm. eight. Wow. Okay. Um, who uh, raised vegan, healthy, doing well? Like, what tips would you give for parents, uh, either to if they don't have children yet and they want to start them from the very beginning, uh, being vegan, plant based, uh, and especially to folks who already have children who've been they've been eating the McDonald's, they've been eating the Wendy's, and they want to try to do better and, and wean them away from that. Like, what tips would you give to parents? Right. So what I would say uh, to parents uh, is the first tip is that you, parent, have to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. You have to model what you want your child to eat. That's the number one thing that you can do. So you can't ask your children to eat, um, you know, fruits and vegetables or badger them to eat fruits and vegetables and you are not eating them yourself. So... um, I, uh, and then you have to make it non-negotiable. So, you know, I use my, my childhood as an example. I didn't like vegetables when I was growing up, but it was a non-negotiable. I was pushing them around on my plate for an hour after my sisters left the table, but my mother did come in and, and put her foot down and say, eat them now, and I had to eat them. So um, it has, you have to model the behavior that you want your child to emulate, and it has to be non-negotiable that this is a part of what they're going. This is just a part of dinner. Um, the other thing that they that they say now for children is to cut the fruits and the vegetables into fun shapes, like stars and circles. So get those, you know, the, the cutters. I guess they they're typically used for cookie dough, and make them into creative shapes: the stars, the moons, the rockets, um, faces, bunnies you know, that kind of thing, and just leave them out on the table. So you can cut the fruit, uh, you know, in those shapes. Just leave them out and and let them be pickable for your children. Have a bowl of berries, um, a bowl of oranges, a bowl of bananas, just any of a bowl of baby carrots out on your countertop in the kitchen all the time and give your kids unlimited access to it. Um, so that's another tip. Um, the other thing is to, is to let your children pick out a color. So if your children, they shop with you. So you can tell your child, you know, this week we're going to have red and purple vegetables. Which ones do you want? 
and you show them the red and purple vegetables in the store and you let them pick the ones that they want. And, you know, it might be a red pepper or tomato or eggplant or uh, purple or blue potato. And then you decide together what you're going to make uh, for dinner using that vegetable or that and or that fruit. And um, if your child is old enough, you have them help you cook it. Um, if not, you tell them, you know, that you're using what they picked. And so they get involved and they get more interested in the, um, in the dish because they've helped in some way with it. If you're able to grow a garden in your backyard or in the community, by all means, have your child involved and let them see the process from planting the seed to actually growing something like a carrot. They are more likely to actually pick it from the ground, rinse it off, and pop it in their mouth if they've grown it. So um, that's another tip. On my, um, on my blog, uh, I have, uh, I was recently interviewed about this very question, and I have about 16 tips of um, ways that parents can get their children to eat more fruits and vegetables. So those are just some um, that, I that I wanted to share that I, that I recall off the top of my head. Right on. Folks, you can go again to the blog uh, if you go to buyanygreensnecessary.com. Uh, you'll see the tab for the blog. Uh, you can see all of her uh, recent posts, uh, even her visit to uh, C-SPAN. Uh, I do see uh, we had some folks that dialed in with questions. Uh, our caller in Alabama, uh, did you have a question for Tracy? Your line should be open. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I had two questions. Um, my first one, I'd be like, when you first um, became a vegan, uh, in, uh, uh, vegetarian or whatever, a lot of the um, stuff y'all eat, like, was it, like, did you really miss me a whole lot? Did you, did you miss it? Okay. What you, you want to ask your second question at the same time? No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking the first one, um, like, was okay. it hard to stop eating meat? Did you miss it, uh... Did you feel yeah. weak or like sometimes I might feel weak if I don't eat meat. Like if I only eat vegetables, I kind of feel, I don't know, I just feel like weaker. I don't know what it is. Well, it don't give me as much energy, I, I guess. I don't know. Well, it was, it was hard. It took me about a year to transition. So, yes, in the beginning, it is hard to break a habit. And it was hard for me to break that habit of eating meat and then uh, eating dairy. Um, as far as, uh, so what you, so what you just said, so that's the first thing. Yes, it can be hard. It's a transition. You're doing something totally different. Usually, um, and it's, you know, it just depends on you and, um, what you're fixing, uh, how much, you know, you eat out, how much you cook in, you know, if you have restaurants to go to, as I said. 27 years ago, when I transitioned, there was no Whole Foods. There were hardly any vegan restaurants around except for the, you know, ones, the, the, the ones that were right by Howard. So it was very difficult to just go out or to, you know, go to, to, go to a restaurant and, and have something vegan if I didn't want to cook or didn't know what to cook. Today, it is so much easier to transition. You can go to any grocery store and get something vegan. Um, already um, packaged for you. So, but the second part of your question is you said, if I don't eat meat and I just eat vegetables, I feel weak. So, the thing is, is that you're not just eating vegetables. Being a vegetarian or being a vegan is about eating plant-based foods. So, the ingredients are different, but you're still, but you're eating much more than just vegetables, Okay. So as I said, if I'm having a brunch, if I'm having waffles or pancakes, um, or I'm having, you know, they have uh, bacon or sausage that is made from um, soy, or, you know, I don't eat much of these things anymore, but when I was starting out, I was transitioning, I ate a lot of these um, plant-based meats, is what they call them, or plant-based proteins, that... Um, that emulate chicken or sausage or bacon or cheese um, to get me over the hump because, you know, some people need that. And I certainly did when I was transitioning. So it's not like you're just eating salad. You are eating 
a full meal, but the ingredients that you're using are all plant-based, okay? So um, that's, a, that's a misconception that people have that, you know, they got a piece of steak on their plate one day, and the next day they just have potato and salad there's going to be something that takes the place of that piece of steak or that piece of chicken, too. I heard, um, I'll finish my last two questions. I heard, um, mushrooms and broccoli have just as much protein in them and meat, so, like, you can replace those, is it possible that you can replace those type of foods and, you know, kind of substitute that? protein other than, you know, just having meat protein? Or yeah, sure, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, all plant-based foods have protein in them in, certain am in different amounts. Even fruit has a small amount of protein, but there's certain vegetables that have a lot of protein, certain grains that have a lot of protein, certain beans and nuts and lentils and split peas and seeds that have a lot of protein. So it is very easy to get all of the protein that you need on a plant-based diet. It's almost impossible to be, to, to be protein insufficient on a, on a plant-based diet. So, um, yeah, you can absolutely, like you can have, if one of your favorite meals is a, a, like a chicken stir-fry, say, for, over pasta. So instead of the chicken, you might, uh, you know, in your stir-fry, you might put uh, some cashews. You might put a cup of cashews in it. Cashews are loaded with protein. There are almonds in it with broccoli, with uh, red bell peppers, with mushrooms, with corn. You might throw some black beans in there. Um, and you have that over a corn pasta or a whole, gra or whole wheat pasta or a quinoa pasta. You might have it over brown rice. And you've got a full meal with all of the nutrients that your body needs but what you don't have is cholesterol and a lot of saturated fat that will clog your arteries and lead to chronic disease. So it's very, very easy to substitute. I don't even use the word substitute, really. You just change ingredients. So does that, is that helpful? And so basically it sounds like you need recipes. So what I would suggest, you can go to my website and look up recipes, or you can just Google vegan recipes. There are thousands and thousands of them, and it will give you a good sense of, uh, you know, or check out my book. I've got a seven-day meal plan, and it's available in, the, in, in all the libraries, too. So, um, you know, just look at some of the recipes, and it will give you an idea of what a, of what a really full, delicious vegan plate looks like. Okay. So this, this, you, 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 you hit the nail on the head because that was my last question. I was going to ask you, how do you see the your collard greens, but like you said, I'm going to check your website out. Well, I can tell you. I see the, I, I can, I have a, I, have, I can tell you. Collard greens are one of my favorite, I, I still buy collard greens. So I use uh, olive oil and garlic and sun-dried tomatoes, and I use something called nutritional yeast, which is like uh, Parmesan cheese, but it's non-dairy and, and it's full of nutrients, um, and I sprinkle that on it. Um, and I use uh, uh, sea salt, and that's how I season it, and it's absolutely delicious. I also have a spicy kale salad that's raw. It's kale, and um, I use, uh, again, I use olive oil. I use uh, black liquid aminos or sea salt, this nutritional yeast, um, and it makes, and it wilts the lettuce so that it looks, I mean, it wilts the kale so that it, and I, and I use a lot of cayenne pepper, and it wilts it. So it tastes like it's been sautéed, but it actually has not been. It's raw. And it is the most popular dish in my book, the, the spicy kale salad. I mean, I, when I have to take it when my relatives for Thanksgiving, when we have gatherings, like, like holiday gatherings, my relatives who eat meat and dairy, I cannot walk in the door without having my spicy kale salad. So. Yeah, I never ate kale, but I saw it. And I thought about it. I looked at a YouTube video on how to cook kale. And I mm -hmm. said, I'm going to try to it. I'm going to want to know how to taste. But I appreciate you answering my questions and everything. And I'm going um, to just mute my line and continue to listen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I call her uh, last four digits, 8043. 8043. Did you have a question for Tracy? 
Yes, good good evening uh, to your guests, good evening to Gus and the listening audience. I just wanted to, um, I wanted to share um, as far as like the meat eating, from my understanding and research, uh, they are putting a lot of products in the meat that's addicting people. So meat is more than just a habit, it's an addiction, and whenever you stop eating it, your body will have a reaction. That reaction is called detoxification. So when all of those toxins begin to dunk into your bloodstream, then you will feel weak and you'll feel some other symptoms. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share was I have three sons who are now grown, and I raised them as vegans. And one thing that I used was some psychology. So after uh, each meal, I would have them line up and let me feel their muscles. And so they would stand up and show me their muscle, and I'd have an eye on the plate. And if the plate was pretty much empty, the muscles would be very strong, so on and so forth. So I used a lot of psychology. I also made food very fun, very much fun. So we would pat our heads and rub our bellies at the same time with the idea of eating a salad, <clears throat> that kind of thing. Um, I was raised from the age of 14, and I'm in my 60s, uh, as a vegetarian by my mom. We did eat um, some cheese and, and uh, um, some, um, some of the dairy products. Um, and over the years, uh, I have learned, because I did run a vegetarian cafe for a while, presentation is very, very important to make the food appealing. And I would say most of the people who came out uh, to the cafe were meat-eating people. They were not vegetarians. And so I would like to add, you know, the presentation issue. When you make it beautiful and, it, and, and you add your fresh herbs and spices, people really go for that. And I need my life. No, well, sister, I all I can say is amen, and uh, you, I, I amen everything that you said, and you sound like, uh, you know, that you raised your children um, vegan, and you've been vegetarian since 14, and then um, became vegan. It's awesome, and it's just another example of how um, there's so many of us who have been doing this for a very long time, and it's not an and it's not an anomaly uh, in our community. So. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing. Right on. Uh, if other folks have questions, don't wait till the last minute. Uh, the number again, 760-569-7676. And the code is 564-943-POUND. Uh, press star six if you have a question uh, for Miss Tracy Lynn McWhorter. Um, I know a lot of uh, folks making the transition. Um, I recognize some of myself in this book. Like, I, cheese was the last thing that I gave up. Like, that was really difficult. Um, I don't know why, but I saw that you also, uh, cheese was uh, one of the last things that you gave up in your transition. Um, fish was another very difficult one for me. Um, I was raised in a mm -hmm. household where a lot of people were big seafood fans, and uh, we didn't even have turkey for Thanksgiving. We had uh, crab and lobster, huge seafood fans uh, for Thanksgiving. Um, you have a whole chapter uh, in your book, uh, Fishing for Trouble. I uh, wanted to uh, read a little bit and get your response. This is on uh, page 49. Uh, I can hear you now. What's wrong with fish? From my experience, many folks think fish is an honorary vegetable. <laughs> I say this because when I tell them I'm a vegan, they'll often say, you eat fish, right? My response is, what type of vegetable is fish? Great question. It amazes me how perfectly acceptable it is to assume that people who are vegans or vegetarians eat fish. They've even invented a name for it pescatarians by they but they might as well just call them meat eaters because fish is an animal not a plant it's an animal that lives in the water it comes in many shapes and sizes and colors from goldfish to sharks when you eat fish you're eating meat 
So no, vegans and vegetarians don't eat fish. Part of the confusion stems from the myth that fish is good for you. I'll read that sentence again. Part of the confusion stems from the myth that fish is good for you. Yes, myth. It is so ingrained in our minds that fish is healthy that many of you are thinking right now that I must be crazy. They mean Tracy, not me. But I'm wondering how you could think that eating a smelly chunk of decomposing flesh from polluted waters is somehow healthy. I already know the answer. Advertising. You've swallowed the commercial bait of the fishing industry hook, line, and sinker. But here's the truth. Fish is not a healthy food. Far from it. Toxins. Last paragraph. Fish is one of the most contaminated foods on the market. Uh, I'll read that sentence again. Fish is one of the most contaminated foods on the market. It's contaminate, contaminated from mercury, arsenic, PCBs, dioxins, DDT, lead, aluminum, and radioactive waste that are dumped into our oceans and rivers by the ton every day. Seafood is, in fact, the leading cause of food poisoning in the United States, according to the Center for Science in the Public Interest, a leading consumer health advocacy group. Mercury, in this case, a specific type known as methylmercury, is perhaps the most dangerous toxin we consume when we eat fish. Uh, before you respond, I just want to uh, remind folks, uh, they just recognized the four-year anniversary of the BP oil spill down in the Gulf, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Gulf area. I think you have a lot of people, uh, crawfish and all kinds of other uh, seafoods that people love, the shrimp for the gumbo and everything. And I think we're also closing in on the three-year anniversary of uh, Fukushima in Japan, I think for folks on the West Coast, you've probably heard a lot more about that. Uh, and radioactive material, uh, may, I mean, this is one planet we all, when they say everybody's connected, I mean, for real. Uh, and they're talking about that a lot for people who do any fishing or living on the West Coast, close to the Pacific. Uh, that stuff does travel. Uh, but your response to fish? Well, yeah, uh, that's the last thing usually to go for people um, is, is fish. That's the holdout um, because people feel that they must eat fish. They must have some flesh on their plate. And, you know, that's what it is, is a piece of, of muscle tissue from, from an animal. So that's like the last holdout. And the fishing industry has so ingrained in us through advertising that fish is healthy, that people honestly cannot believe that this is unhealthy. And maybe because it's a fish as opposed to a big cow or a big pig, I don't know. Um, but, you know, uh, fish still contains uh, saturated fat and cholesterol, which can clog your arteries um, and lead to chronic disease. Um, just like um, poultry and uh, beef, the, you know, but as you read, you know, as I said in the book, the main issue with fish is that it is so contaminated. And so uh, a lot of people say, okay, well, you know, well, what about farm-raised fish? Let's just go straight to that. So maybe it is contaminated, but I eat farm-raised fish from, and I buy it at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or, or something like that. And so I talk about that also because what happens with farm, so-called farm-raised fish is that, you know, these fish are raised in, um, in, a, in a created environment near shores, right? And so fish poop, right? They're animals, they poop, and so uh, they're in this contained environment. And to deal with the parasitic uh, infestation that comes um, this poop infested water, they, these fish um, uh, come with, uh, you know, antibiotics. And uh, so you're dealing with the saturated fat and cholesterol that's naturally in the fish, and then you're um, dealing with the um, antibiotics to deal with the parasite infection um, in the fish. And also, 
fish, let's take salmon, for example, because I think it's the most popular fish on the market. And, and they're, you know, this wild, this uh, farm-raised salmon is very popular. So you, you're dealing with these issues, right, that I just mentioned. But also what the fish are fed is pellets that contain uh, ground-up lots of things, um, ground-up animals, sod dust, um, a whole bunch of uh, material that is not normally consumed by fish that are in the wild. And these pellets create a color that is dull gray. It turns the, the salmon from pink to a dull gray. And so what the um, farm fishing industry does is put dye in these pellets to turn the fish back to their natural color. And so you're ingesting the dye as well. And so this is the craziness of farmed raised fish, something from raised salmon, something that people just think is healthy and natural to eat and have, have no clue about how contaminated and unnatural this food actually is. So I also talk about um, the, uh, how, these, you know, how the fish is caught and the cruelty involved with it, um, because you know we're not a, we're, we are actually talking about animals, and even fish are sentient beings. And you know this is there's no need for us to eat animals um, because it's unhealthy for us, but it's also uh, you know cruel to the animals as well. And this is something that I didn't know in the beginning, and I was 10 or 15 years into being a vegan before I even actually cared about the the um, I had compassion about animals, you know, in a way that first struck me when I was in Kenya. But that was it. It kind of came and left in that moment. But it was years later that I actually started to understand the cruelty involved in, um, in all of these industries, um, whether it's raising chickens or pigs or cows and, and even fish. So um, uh, I do have an entire chapter about it, and I talk about methylmercury in particular and why it's harmful for, for pregnant women. Um, so there's just, a, there's just a lot there, and, and I, I encourage people to read the chapter um, to learn all about fish. I will say one other thing. A lot of people say, okay, well, I won't eat the fish, you know, but what about, you know, the omega oils that I need? I have to get that from fish. And you don't because when you, you, you it's healthier to get the omega oils from plant-based sources like walnuts and, and um, flax seeds and, and other plant-based sources because when you get it from fish, you're also getting the toxins that are in the fish in that oil. And so um, there's no need to ingest that. Amen. Um. And again, just, you know, keeping the totality of all this, that's why I thought that chapter uh, in Yurugu, Dr. Marimba Ani, where she talks about how uh, racists, they don't just contaminate other people and harm and terrorize other people. They're doing this against the planet as well. Uh, that's why, again, we are, it was April 20th. I mean, we just did the four-year anniversary to the BP oil spill. And mm -hmm. you have white people coming out and saying, hey, it's great, man. It's wonderful. There's no oil, no contamination. Everything's great. They did like a whole commercial uh, campaign mm -hmm. saying this. And then people were going out and saying, man, I see oil slicks all the time. And you're eating that too. I mean, that's just one of many uh, oil spills and the plastic that they're dumping uh, in the water. I mean, it's just massive contamination. When Dr. Campon says uh, they've turned the entire uh, planet into one big cesspool, uh, you should think about that, too, uh, when you go down to make your choices about what goes in the grocery basket, because they have really done a job uh, on all of the water sources on the planet. And go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. And, 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 yeah, and it's true. And not only that, but the, the runoff from factory farming is, you know, affects our rivers and our streams as well, our waterways in this planet. The manure from, um, from cattle farms from raising pigs and raising cows and raising chickens it is massive, and it's contaminating our water. It's contaminating our air. Um, the livestock production is the leading contributor to global warming, um, more than all of the world's transportation combined. So this is not just a matter of, you know, what we personally want to put on our plate, 
but it affects the planet. And so this is one of the reasons why I've been in this for the long haul, because I can just go, I, I can just be like my, you know, I can go on my merry way and be vegan and, you know, not say a word to anybody else and let them live their lives and, you know, die an early death from a preventable chronic disease. And know that I live a long um, and healthy life that's disease-free. I mean, look at my mom. So, but, you know, morally I can't do that, uh, you know, and, and I'm an activist at heart, so I can't do that. But also because I live on the planet and people eating meat and dairy, livestock production affects the planet that I'm living in. And so we just can't tiptoe around this issue anymore. There is no reason for us to be um, partaking in this in this um, this food system the way that we are. There's no reason for us to do it. It's not healthy for us. It's not healthy for the planet. It's not healthy for the animals. And we can't be selfish and close-minded about this anymore. We can't tiptoe around the issue. So it's not about being self-righteous, but it's just about giving people the facts um, and letting us make choices once we have these facts. The, you know, the real deal, and that's why I've broken it down by chapters. A chapter on dairy, there's a chapter on chicken, there's a chapter on fish, there's a chapter on pork, there's a chapter on beef, because I want people to get it all the way through, and there's a chapter on how factory, um, people who work in factory farms are treated. So I give, it, I give you everything. This is, this is a primer. So that you fully understand what you are dealing with when you eat meat and dairy um, on a personal level and a planetary level, and then you can make informed choices from there. Mm. Again, the book is By Any Greens Necessary, uh, and that is also the blog by, or website, by any greens necessary dot com. Uh We had a caller with a question from 1184, caller 1184. Uh, did you have a question for Tracy? Uh, yes, greetings. Greetings. Uh, one, my first question would be: uh, Is there a, a substitute for cheese that's uh, vegetarian, veg, vegetable based, like that, that has that type of uh, texture or something like that? Yes, there. Yes, there are. Um, there are non-dairy. Um, cheeses, plant-based cheeses. Um, I think the one that is closest to uh, dairy cheese is uh, a brand called Daya, D-A-I-Y-A. And uh, so, again, the, you know, and there are other brands as well. There's Soya Cost. Um, there are several non-dairy plant-based uh, cheeses on the market and, they, market, and they will definitely help you get over the hump. Um, and so these are, these are very processed foods, um, and I consider them transition foods. So, you know, if, if being addicted to cheese is an issue for you, it's the, you know, having a non-dairy cheese is healthier, but it's not healthy yet. I see. But it is a bridge, okay? Okay. And okay. And uh, did you do any research on the history of vegetarian in terms of, uh, like, was this like an original diet that mankind had and then they lost or something to that effect? Actually, I have, and, and there's, there's lots of research about, you know, there's lots of research out there about um, why we are herbivores, why we are natural herbivores, the type of um, digestive system we have, the type of um, teeth we have, um, the type of fingers we have, all of these, you know, there are all of these reasons why we are not omnivores why, uh, naturally, why we're not carnivores naturally, that we are, in fact, herbivores. We are made to have uh, a plant-based diet, and that's what we thrive on. And most people around the world have, that are not, uh, whose diets have not been completely westernized have a plant-based diet traditionally. And, uh, and it's not just a matter of, you know, 
impoverishment, which, you know, we think is why people don't eat meat and dairy around the world. Um, that is a factor, um, but the, that's a factor now. But traditionally, it was because it was our natural diet and it was by choice. And if meat was introduced, or, you know, in the form of fish or, um, or poultry, it was as a condiment. It was not as half of the, uh, you know, a piece of um, animal tissue or muscle tissue that's half of the plate or a third of the plate like we eat it here or, as, you know, the center of a hamburger. So uh, it, was just a, it was just a condiment, another source of protein. So, um, you know, this is, this is actually... So you're saying meat was... So you so you're saying meat it was... It was eaten in small amounts. If it was yeah, it was on the uh, central focus as much as it is here now. Exactly, exactly, and, it, and it's you know it's a central focus here because the meat industry has decided that that would be the case, and it's definitely not for health reasons. Any research that uh, shows that um, people who have uh, meat eaters. Uh, have a tendency to be uh, more imposing on other people, more aggressive, more uh, domineering. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of um, there is there is research on that. Um, you know, it's it's I laugh because you know there people say that for different reasons. You know, they'll use that as an example for different things, but you know. The, the reality is um, if you, that there have been studies that show that if you have, take a school system, for example, um, that has uh, a problem with, um, uh, that has a problem with children who um, are, uh, need help with uh, focus, people, uh, children who need help with um, sitting, um, for not for long periods of time, but just generally sitting and and uh, and doing work or interacting with their peers, they might be what is what has been termed ADHD. Um, there may be behavioral problems. There may be a lot of fighting, that kind of thing. So there, you know, there have been um, studies done that have shown that pe that these children, if they live in homes where there is a lot of lead that these children are likely to be, you know, more aggressive and have behavioral issues because of the lead in their bodies. Well, similar studies have shown that children who have diets that are meat and dairy based, um, and you take that out of their diet and you introduce a healthful plant-based diet, tend to uh, do better on tests. They, ha they become... Um, they become calmer, they become more focused, and uh, they are able to study longer. They are able, to, they're, they're all, there are various types of, um, there are various types of factors that they look at in terms of how children do well in school and progress and develop that are affected by diet. And a lot of it is that saturated fat and cholesterol from meat and dairy is no longer being introduced into their bloodstream. In addition to that, um, highly processed foods that are loaded with fat, salt, and sugar are taken away, which causes hyperactivity. So it's not just a matter of taking the meat and dairy out, but it's the processed food, but it's the processed um, fat, salt, and sugar that comes with meat and dairy in packaged foods that also get taken out at the same time, and this tends to make the child healthier developmentally, um, socially, mentally, in all of the ways that matter in terms of how we want our children to progress in school. So um, absolutely this has been shown and this has been proven. And children who are actually raised on a vegan diet from birth are developmentally are one year ahead of, their, of children who are raised as omnivores. So this is... This is, in fact, the case. It is the best thing that you can do for your child to introduce them to a healthy plant-based diet. Okay. And I didn't get what's the difference between vegetarian and vegan. 
The difference between vegetarian and vegan, excellent question. So uh, vegetarians do not eat meat, do not eat, uh, you know, from fish on up to uh, beef. They don't eat any flesh that comes from an animal. But they may eat uh, the fluids of an animal in, in the form of milk uh, or cheese or ice cream or, or uh, yogurt, you know, made from milk, the fluids. Uh, the nursing secretions of an animal, they also may eat the eggs of animals. So uh, the only thing the vegetarians and vegans uh, will not do that's feared is eat the flesh or the muscle tissue of an animal, okay? The vegetarians may eat um, dairy products. So vegans will eat absolutely nothing that comes from an animal. No flesh, no meat, no uh, eggs, no milk. Nothing, no animal byproducts whatsoever. So all of the foods that we eat are made from ingredients that originate from plants. Now, I, I will say, too, that the animals that we eat are getting their nutrients from plants. So cows uh, are naturally vegetarian. Chickens, naturally vegetarian. So uh, pigs, all of these animals that we eat are getting their nutrition, their nutrients from plants. We're actually getting it secondhand. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For uh, I used to be ready to a little while back. Thanks a lot. I, I enjoy your enthusiasm. Thank you. Uh, the person that called in, uh, 36 66, if you had a question for Tracy, your line should be open. Uh, yes, Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I just have a very quick question. I suffer from um, anemia all my life, and um, I guess my question is, aside from the traditional things you hear about getting more iron, with various vegetables, such as broccoli, which I don't like, or spinach, which I don't like. Do you have any other suggestions? I mean, if there are none, then I understand, but I'm just hoping to get some suggestions from you if possible. Sure. Usually what happens with, uh, with omnivores, with people who eat meat and dairy who um, experience anemia, the fact that they are eating dairy products is contributing to their anemia. It's contributing to iron stores being used to remove um, the um, saturated fat and cholesterol um, from your and the, um, the animal-based calcium from your body. So when you eat uh, so the dairy products that you eat are directly contributing to the use and then the secretion of the iron stores, the secretion of the iron stores in your body. So the first thing that I tell people to do um, if they are experiencing anemia is to limit or avoid dairy products altogether. Um, the second thing is, to, I'm sorry? I said thank you. I had no idea about that. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. I, I talk about, I, I do talk about that in the book as well. And then the second thing is, you know, you can actually use plant-based foods to increase um, the amount of iron that you're getting in your diet. So, you know, you, you mentioned that you don't like certain, um, certain vegetables. So there are lots of ways that you can, um, you know, there are lots of foods that contain iron, you know, um, you know, the, the, you might want to have um, some figs or um, there are just, you know, there's so many. You might want to have, um, and you can actually, if you don't like figs, you can soak them and drink the water. Um, there are lots okay. of ways, yeah, there are lots of ways that you can, um, that you can get iron. There's also grains that you can get them from and lots of plant-based sources for iron. Um, as long as you eat a varied diet, a varied um, plant-based diet, you generally don't have to worry about nutrient deficiency. So, but the first thing I would say is that you want to limit the amount of dairy products in your diet. Well, I really, really appreciate that because I do, I drink a lot of milk. So I think oh, that, yeah. that's yeah, contributing yeah, to it, then yeah. I have to cut that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'll meet my You're welcome. Mm. You're welcome. 
uh, you uh, you have a whole segment in your book uh, on milk. I wanted to read that segment. I'm glad the caller brought that up because I used to hear that a lot from uh, a lot from people. I think protein, iron, those would be the two main uh, elements that people would mention and say, "Oh, I got to make sure that I get this in my diet." And if you go vegetarian or vegan, uh, you'll really be missing out on uh, iron, calcium, and you'll be so weak and I would just, I mean, the more that I read, like when I got into research, it was just like, wow, like we have really been poorly educated about food, like vegetables, like yeah. you can get all of that stuff uh, in great abundance generally from eating vegetables. And oftentimes a lot of the, the meat products that we're eating, as you talked about, they're so contaminated and really artificial that there are not very many nutrients in that to begin with. I mean, right. like, I mean, if we're talking about as you McDonald's French fries or whatever, I mean, <laughs> pretty much any vegetable that you have is going to beat that hands down every time. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> but the, uh, the segment that you have in your book on calcium, this is on uh, 64, which I thought was really important, uh, particularly for black females to hear. Uh, you write that if you don't drink milk, oh, and I, I wrote that down, nursing secretions. That's, wow, she is, uh, <laughs> I'm going to use that, nursing secretions. Uh, if you don't drink milk, where will you get your calcium? The dairy industry wants you to believe that calcium equals milk. Just like the meat industry wants you to believe that protein equals meat. But, as we saw in the previous chapter, it just doesn't add up. Calcium is a mineral in food, but it is not the food itself. So yes, cow's milk is a source of calcium for calves. But even calves stop drinking cow's milk when they're old enough and fortunate enough to eat their natural grass diet. Think about it. Eating grass provides enough calcium in a cow's bones to support its weight up to a thousand pounds. Human breast milk is also a source of calcium for infants. But even humans stop drinking breast milk when they're old enough and fortunate enough to eat our natural plant-based diet. The healthiest and most abundant sources of calcium for humans are grains, greens, and beans. And eating them doesn't lead to the chronic diseases that drinking cow's milk does, nor does it lead to osteoporosis. On the other hand, drinking cow's milk not only can lead to chronic diseases, it can actually cause calcium loss in your body. The heavy load of animal protein in cow's milk consists of sulfur-containing amino acids, meth methione, and cysteine, which cause the blood to become acidic. The body releases calcium and other minerals from the bones to neutralize the acid and return the blood to an alkaline state. This calcium is, the, is then excreted through the urine. Eating animal protein day in and day out, year after year, leads to calcium depletion from the bones, which can result in weak bone mass and bone fractures. The countries that eat the most dairy, United States, England, Sweden, and Finland, predominantly white countries, all of them, I think, also have mm -hmm. the highest rates of osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is not the result of too little calcium, as the milk industry would have us believe. In addition, black women are systematically excluded from osteoporosis studies because black women have higher bone density rates than all other women and are less likely to develop the disease. Nevertheless, these studies have been used as the basis for federal recommendations that encourage all women to consume multiple servings of dairy products daily. As I said earlier, the racism is ubiquitous. Uh, your response to this segment and, and our consumption of dairy? Well, thank you for reading that. And, and um, you know, I will also say that this, um, this recommendation that we eat, that we consume dairy products, three times, uh, you know, three servings a day is um, also not based on um, African-Americans um, or other people of color. And 
most people around the world, most people of color, are uh, lactase persistent. Now, most people have heard the term lactose intolerant, and people think that if they can't digest milk or uh, yogurt or ice cream, that they're lactose intolerant, right? And um, so they might take an aid, you know, um, to help them be able to digest dairy products. Well, what's happening is that you are no longer, once you are weaned or beyond the weaning stage, your body no longer produces the enzyme to digest the milk sugar from human breast milk, from your mother's breast milk. So that means we are not supposed to be consuming human breast milk, our mother's breast milk, after the weaning stage. So we have no use for this enzyme, so we stop producing it. But what we do in this country and other countries is that we continue to drink milk or consume products that contain milk, but we no longer have this enzyme to digest it, to break down the, blood sh the, the, um, the milk sugar so that we can digest it. And so we get all of the conditions associated with not being able to digest this milk. Um, now, you know, of course we're not consuming human breast milk after weaning. We're consuming cow's milk. And, I mean, it's ridiculous. We're consuming cows nursing secretions that even calves won't drink. So we don't have the enzyme to digest um, milk after weaning, but still we persist in eating uh, and, and drinking, consuming milk-based products. So, you know, this term has been, called, was, has been coined, um, this condition has been coined lactose intolerance. intolerance. And most people in the world you know, don't, no longer produce this enzyme. And so I'm going to find, I'm going to read you the actual um, breakdown. Okay, here it is. Um, and if you have the book, it's on page 60. Um, the USDA dietary guidelines recommend that all Americans consume three servings of milk or other dairy products every day. This completely disregards the fact that the majority of people of color in the United States cannot digest milk or milk products. That includes 90 to 95% of Asian Americans, 95% of Native Americans, 65 to 75% of African Americans, 50 to 60% of Latino and Latinas, and only 10% of European Americans. So here again, the government is completely disregarding um, the majority of people of color in this country who normally and naturally no longer are able to digest nursing secretions from any mammal beyond infancy. So we should not be consuming uh, milk products, dairy products at all, um, that our government, because of it's in bed with the milk industry tells us that we should because it means more profits for the milk and dairy industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, wow. Uh, there was a, a caller, actually, uh, Bruce Bonch. He was uh, the person who informed me about your book and I uh, really wanted to have you on the program, uh, Black Female. Uh, she said, uh, could you speak to the health benefits of uh, wheatgrass and chlorella? Yeah, of course. So um, she may be she may be referring to as well. So um, the the um, the benefits of um, chlorophyll chlorophyll is the substance um, that we are consuming when we eat dark green leafy vegetables, and wheatgrass has. Uh, chlorophyll in abundance. Um, and a lot of people, you can actually um, grow your own wheatgrass, um, and it's actually grass. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, are teased vegetarians or vegans and call them grass munchers, but really it is, it, it, that's, that's the deal. Vegetation plants are the things that we are supposed to be eating. That's, that's where we get the nutrients. The plants are converting energy from the sun and converting it into fuel that we need for our bodies. And so um, consuming wheatgrass or any dark leafy greens, um, whether it's collards or kale or mustard 
or spinach or Swiss chard or dandelion greens are excellent. The thing about the thing about wheatgrass is that you tend to have to have a very high powered blender like a Vitamix um, in order to grind it up um, in a you know in a smoothie to make it to be able to to drink it or an actual wheatgrass juicer. And a lot of people just don't have these products. Um, or don't know enough, or, or don't have the, you know, the, or can't make the investment to get them, um, to be able to consume them daily. And so you can buy, um, you know, if you're not able to do wheatgrass, you know, or, or go to a store and get frozen wheatgrass juice, or go to a juice bar and get wheatgrass, then start with the dark leafy greens. That is the that is the most important thing that you can do after this conversation ends, is to add more dark leafy greens to your plate to get the chlorophyll that your body needs. And I tell people to make half of your plate dark leafy greens if you can. Half of your plate, start there. You, you know, if you can't start by uh, taking away something off of your plate, meat or dairy, then start by adding and adding dark leafy greens to half your plate. And if you can't do half your plate, make it a third of your plate for um, every um, lunch and dinner every day. And in the mornings, I recommend that people have smoothies, fruit smoothies. That's primarily made with berries, uh, frozen berries or fresh berries, any berry, um, and uh, because they're low in sugar. And add a leaf or two of kale or a leaf or two of spinach um, so that you get your greens in the morning as well. So um, I hope that answers the question. If you're able to get wheatgrass, to grow it, to, uh, to put it in a blender or to use a wheatgrass juicer, then that is the healthiest way to, I mean, that's, that's the best way, the most abundant way to get the chlorophyll. Um, or to get frozen wheatgrass juice from the store. If you're not able to do that, then start with the darkest leafy greens that you can. Outstanding. Right on. Um, I guess just disclosure, if we may ask, uh, it's evening, so I assume you've had several meals. Uh, do you mind sharing, like, what you ate today? Uh, sure. So this morning I had a green smoothie, which I have every morning, and I, I fill up and I used uh, dandelion greens. So I had uh, blueberries and uh, banana and uh, dandelion greens and uh, coconut water and uh, um a uh, handful of cashews, and I blended that up, and it made uh, almost uh, seven, six to seven cups worth, and I drank that half of that in the morning and then the rest throughout the day. Um, and then I made a stir-fry, a tempeh stir-fry. So I used uh, tempeh, which is a healthy, uh, a healthy uh, product made from soybeans, and um, I made a... Uh, you know, and a lot of people will use that instead of chicken. So I chopped up some uh, tempeh. I stir-fried it with some basil, olive oil, red onion, garlic, uh, Thai curry paste, and uh, cherry tomatoes. And I put that over some uh, brown rice noodles, some noodles that were made with brown rice flour, and added uh, some mixed uh, kale, some red Russian kale, some white Russian kale, some lacinato kale, and some curly kale. And I had a big bowl of that um, for lunch. And uh, then I ate the rest of it for dinner. So that's what I had today. Hmm. Very tasty. Very tasty. <laughs> um, it was delicious. That I think it's kind of important so people can see how that would operate um, just in their lives on a regular basis where uh, you're eating good, uh, you're being well-nourished, uh, and you're not famished. <laughs> you walk around feeling like, yeah, I ate. It was great. It was tasty. And let's move on to the next thing. Um, right. I, I can, may I also say that um, I, I did a video a couple of years ago um, on uh, making a vegan pizza, and, I, mm. and it's got... And it's got me, it's, it's been seen a lot. I think it's got maybe 15, 16,000 views now. And it's a very um, healthy, 
basic vegan pizza recipe, and that's like a great Friday night pizza recipe that anybody can do. The recipe is in my book, but it's also, there's a video on YouTube, so just Google um, by any degrees necessary vegan pizza or just how to make a vegan pizza, and it will pop up. And that's a really easy uh, dish that will please kids and adults and teenagers alike, and I, and I uh, eat that a lot. Wow, I found it on YouTube. I'm going to put it uh, on our Facebook page so folks will have it. I'll tweet it out as well uh, so you all can get the uh, recipe. And this is a quickie. It's only like six minutes. So you can watch this and bang, there you go. You don't have to miss out on your pizza if you're hanging out doing the uh, party for the children or sporting party, whatever the case may be. You can still get your your pizza. And it tastes great as well. Um, Oh, yeah, it's delicious. What what's uh what's your stance? I know there's been a lot of talk, and I at least for me, I think this is important because you talk in your book about confusion. How mm-hmm. they'll come out with one study, and it'll say that oh well, eating you know chicken or eating this is really really good for you. It's great, right on. And then they'll come out with another study that says oh man, eating chicken is bad. It drops up and it just creates an environment of confusion around. What should I eat? What should I not eat? And I think it goes right to the issue uh, with food labeling uh, to find out exactly what products are in this food. What am I consuming? Uh, There's been a lot of wrangling over that and uh, people saying that, you know, this is a waste of time. States have voted on it. I know they have failed uh, in quite a few of the places where they tried to get uh, honest food labeling or more accurate labeling on food. What's your stance on that? You're talking about genetically modified food in particular? Right. Yeah. So um, I am opposed to GMO food, genetically modified organisms, um, absolutely. So I, I think that people uh, should educate themselves on GMOs, and there are lots of resources. One of, one of the best is the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. Um, to learn about GMOs, just Google GMOs. Um, there, are lot, there are lots of resources out there. But the, but the deal is, is that we're being used as guinea pigs right now. To, um, you know, we, GMOs are in most of the product food um, packaging that is on the market. So if you're getting something from a bag or a box on a shelf in a store, it will have genetically modified food in it. It will have genetically modified ingredients in it because it is not labeled. And there are potential health effects, not only to the people who ingest it, but to the people who are picking it, the farm workers. And we can't forget the people who are picking the food for us and the dangers for them as well. So... Um, and a lot of it has to do with the herbicides and the pesticides and the fungicides and the insecticides that are used to help produce these crops. So um, there's a whole there's a whole uh, complexity here that we have to consider. And the fact is that we don't have a choice. And it's been banned in the European Union uh, genetically modified foods. Um, and where it has not, it's been banned in most of the food products in the European Union. And where it has not been banned, labeling is required. But here in the United States, it is not. And that, again, shows the power of the food industry. And so um, we're getting it and we're ingesting it. If the, food, if the product does not say GMO-free or if it does not say organic, then it has genetically modified ingredients in it. And so we are being used as guinea pigs, to, you know, and studies will be done later to see the, the health effects, uh, the negative health effects that this has on us. But the, the point is, is that we don't have a choice. And that is not, um, and that, you know, that's unethical, it's unfair, and it's just all about profit. And so we, whenever we have a choice about this when it comes to our state, I feel that we must uh, vote against it simply because we have the right to be informed. We're we're just talking about labeling at this point. It's already in the food system, at least it's already in the packaging, at least tell us what packaging it's in. They don't even want us to know that, and I think that people should be up in arms about that. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow, we have uh, about 
10 minutes uh, left in the broadcast. If folks, uh, if you have a question that you want to get in uh, before uh, we uh, wrap up, uh, do not be pussyfooting around. Go ahead, get your hand up if you have a question. Uh, I definitely had wanted to make sure um, that I asked the, the title of your book by any greens necessary. Uh, it seems to be to be an homage to Minister Malcolm X. Uh, is there a relationship between the two? And if so, could you elaborate? Absolutely, there's a relationship. I mean, um, it's absolutely um, uh, an homage, a take on um, uh, by any means necessary. And the reason that I that I chose this title is because when I was thinking of the title for the book, I was I wanted it to be something that was uh, that that reflected urgency. I wanted it to be something that reflected blackness. I wanted it to be something that reflected uh, activism, um, uh, political activism, social justice, all of that. And I wanted it, obviously, to be something that was clever and memorable as well. And so um, I was writing down titles and, you know, what just things that came to me. And then I said, well, let me look at, you know, some famous things um, from black folks and see if I can kind of, you know, um, get something from that. And then uh, it just, you know, came to me by any means necessary, by any means necessary, like lightning and boom, that was it. So, uh, I, you know, and I wanted people to, when they heard that, I wanted them to know immediately that I was referring to by any means necessary and that I was referring to the fact that this is a, a political issue. This is an issue that affects black folks and it's urgent and um, that we need to be, we need to know about it. Um, uh, you know, hopefully it will intrigue people and uh, they will um, be, they will see that it's speaking directly to them. It's speaking directly to black folks in particular. So uh, that's the, you know, who I am, I, uh, you know, I've been an activist uh, all my life, and I get that from my mom, and, you know, this is just part of, this is just part of the work that I do, and so I definitely wanted the title um, and the book to reflect that. Mm. Awesome. I think uh, Minister Malcolm spent a pretty good deal of time talking about diet. Uh, you have a whole chapter in your book on pork. I think uh, he is noted for <laughs> I having did. Pork. I talk about him, yeah, and, and Elijah Muhammad mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is, you know, and I, you know, it's, it's so, it's just so, uh, it's so wonderful to have the conversation because, again, this is, this is not, Eating healthfully for black folks is not in a vacuum. This is related to all of our other social justice issues. Naturally, so, these things are all linked for us. This has been my experience. And um, so, you know, it's just not uh, an, anim an issue about animals or just an issue about our own personal health. This is, a, this is an issue about liberation, about taking control of our health and uh, helping our community to liberate uh, themselves. And so, yes, it's very, um, you know, it's very important that people see that these issues are all linked um, to social justice issues. You'll see black vegans talking about veganism and healthy eating, and we'll be at, you know, rallies, you know, against, uh, police brutality. We'll be at rally, you know, any rally, anything that has to do with liberation and social justice for black folks. Um, you know, veganism for us is, is all a part of that. And so when I go to conferences or I go to events and people want to, you know, and, and it's sponsored by Coca-Cola or it's sponsored by McDonald's, I just, it, I, I cringe because that is not what should be happening. That is, you know, that's not who we should be looking to to sponsor our events. We shouldn't be going there after a rally, you know, about uh, George Zimmerman and Trayvon, you know, um, getting off the killing of Trayvon Martin. We shouldn't be going to McDonald's to eat. You know, these things are all linked. And so I really appreciate this conversation, um, you know, where we can talk about linking these, about how these issues are linked. 
Absolutely, absolutely. It, it context <laughs> that uh, everything is within a context. Unfortunately, the context of racism, and I think that that just comes up over over and over and over again. Uh, I feel like uh, throughout this conversation, um, I wanted to. Uh, I get you are informed, and this has been discussed as well. And and in fact, I read an article yesterday where they were talking in. Colorado, uh, they were trying, they were talking about the marketing aspect. You talk about that a lot in your book, how marketing plays into the choices we make. They're talking about marketing uh, cannabis to the organic food crowd and people that are into healthy eating and healthy, uh, healthy living. And they said that they wanted their shop to be like the whole foods of cannabis. Um, this issue, I think I've, I'm seeing it linked uh, when people are talking about this needs to be, uh, we need to be looking at changing uh, and making cannabis a legal substance. Uh, do you have a view on that? Do you think that would be something beneficial to black people? I actually am, I, I'm not well informed. I, I'm informed on a peripheral level about, um, about cannabis and about hemp. Mm. Um, but it's, um, and from my understanding, I'm, I know more about hemp than I know about, um, about can, about the issue of cannabis. So, um, you know, I don't feel that I can, I can really speak on it from a, from um, the perspective that would be helpful for people. I'm sure that there there are folks out there who know a lot about a lot more about the issue than I do. Um, it's not something, um, it's not it's, it's not something that appeals to me. It's not something that I that I um, really am fighting for. Um, to, you know, for people to have access to, and it may simply be, you know, a lack of knowledge on my part at this at this stage in the game, um, you know, and the more I read about it, the, I might become more active about it, but from what I know now, uh, not so much, you know, it's not a, it's not a battle cry for me. I respect that. Um... Uh, I also saw, and this is just, again, like I said, about confusion, uh, where you end up, uh, and I, even I've heard Mr. Fuller speak about this, where he says uh, in a racist environment, a lot of what they do operates from deception. So you end up mm-hmm. with all this conflicting information, and it can be difficult. You talk about that in the book. I can just, you can just get to the point where you say, ah, forget it, I'm just going to eat whatever I want. Um, you talk yeah. about uh, soy in the book and saying that there's been a lot of confusion. Is it good for you? Is it not? You seem to conclude that it is beneficial. Yeah, so the, so the deal is um, that uh, soy, the studies that have been done, um, they have been consistently done for the past uh, 40 years show that soy-based, that some soy-based products are healthy and uh, in certain forms. They help to prevent breast cancer and uh in women, and for women who have breast cancer, it helps to prolong their life. I mean, these studies are consistent. So, um, soy has been vilified uh, by the dairy industry because the, the, the way that most people get soy in this country is through soy milk, and that is a direct, uh, that is in direct competition to cow's milk. So um, people have to understand that, 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 this is the, that this is the root of a lot of this vilification of soy. That's one thing. The other thing is that there is some vilification of soy that is justified, and that is soy that's in the form of things like uh, soy pepperoni um, or soy ice cream or soy bologna or soy cheese, you know, those kinds of things are highly processed, created foods. And people in uh, traditional, uh, people who traditionally ate soy in Asian societies ate healthier versions of soy in the form of tempeh, in the form of miso, in the form, which is a, which is a paste that is used kind of like we would use vegetable stock. Uh, in the form of edamame, which is the, which is soybeans in a pod, um, and uh, the soybean itself as cooked as a bean, and so these are healthier natural versions of of uh, natural ways to eat soy, just like we would eat any bean uh, 
any other bean, any black bean or red bean or black eyed peas or kidney beans. These are healthier ways to eat soy, but, um, and they were eaten as condiments. And they were eaten as part of any other uh, bean, you know, as, as, um, as something that is eaten just like any other bean. When it was introduced in this country, it was introduced as soy milk, which is processed, and then it was used as a uh, product to substitute for a piece of meat on a plate or in a sandwich. Um, or on pizza in ways that it was never eaten traditionally. And these highly processed foods are difficult to digest. They often have a lot of saturated fat, a lot of sodium. And so they are not the healthiest ways to uh, consume soy. So they are problematic. But if you're eating it as a soy bean, as edamame, as miso, as tempeh, or even as tofu, the studies have shown consistently that um, it is healthy for you. So when you so if you choose to eat soy in these forms, you want to make sure that it's organic because if it is not organic, it is definitely genetically modified, and you want to steer clear of that. Now, um, you do not have to eat soy. Again, it is a bean. It is one of hundreds of beans that are available. So you don't have to have soy in your diet if you don't want to have it, if you don't believe it's healthy, if you don't believe the studies, if you just don't want to deal with it because you're confused and you don't know what to think. Or you've read studies that convince you you should not have soy. Don't eat it. It's just one of many um, types of beans um, out there, and you don't have to have it. Outstanding. Um... Wow, such great information. Um, I would highly encourage folks to get the book. Uh, not just black females. I think everybody, every black person could benefit from the information uh, in By Any Greens Necessary, a revolutionary guide for black women who want to eat great, get healthy, lose weight, and look fat. And that's P-H-A-T. Um, phenomenal info. You can get it. Uh, it's available on Amazon.com. Uh, you can also go to her website to get more information about the book, recipes that she talked about, tips uh, for parents to help their children make healthy uh, dining choices. Uh, the blog is the book title, by any greens necessary dot com. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed having you on the program and uh, would definitely love to have you on the program anytime to uh, promote anything that you're working on or just to get the information out because I know uh, this is, I mean, this is huge. You, I mean, if you want to make a blow against racism, be more mindful and plant-based about what you eat and you can have a huge impact uh, on racism, especially if you can also influence some other black people uh, to uh, cease permanently fast food, McDonald's, meat, all that, yeah. and make healthier choices. Thank you very much for having me on the show, and thank you for this program and the work that you're doing. Um, I, I think it's fabulous and so needed, and thank you for your passion. Hey, it's uh, vital work. Uh, just like I said, really, really appreciate the chance to get the info to our audience. Uh, some of them, they already knew about your about your stuff, so we're just all super grateful. And uh, we'll be visiting the website and hopefully uh, appreciating your work with the choices that we make about what goes in our mouth. Uh, I think that would be the biggest compliment to your, uh, to your work and what you're doing. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening and uh, keep up the much-needed, outstanding work. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you. You have a good evening. You too. You too. Bye-bye. Good evening. Context of white supremacy. Great, 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 great information. Uh, the book title again, By Any Greens Necessary, A Revolutionary Guide for Black Women Who Want to Eat Great, Get Healthy, Lose Weight, and look fat. Uh, hit the website. Uh, it's got her blog so you can see uh, more current things that she's talking about. Uh, again, it's got a link. When she did a, a segment on C-SPAN, you can watch the video, recipes, tips, uh, lots of information. Just go to the blog. By any greens necessary dot com. Thanks to Bruce Fine and Pam for alerting me about her work in the first place. I hope uh, you all got to hear the program and enjoy. Uh, we will take a quick commercial. And I think I found that segment uh, that I was telling folks about from uh, 
last summer where they were talking about food because as she said this doesn't happen in a vacuum i mean when you don't eat healthy choices you don't make healthy uh, options available for your children about what they're going to be eating what you all are going to be putting in your body where you're going to go what are you going to eat this should just be uh, kept in mind in terms of when we make those other choices to go to get fast food and things that aren't healthy. Uh, it's not just how that is damaging our bodies, our minds, our spirit. Uh, I mean, there are economic factors as well that are associated with whom we spend our money and how we access our food. Uh, again, this is from, uh, it's right after <laughs> she mentioned it, the Trayvon Martin situation from last summer. It was, I think, a month or so after the trial. Uh, where they did this segment on NPR. And I mean, this is just, you take everything that's in her book by any greens necessary. You take all that information uh, that you've got a wealth of reasons to make changes uh, with regards to what we eat. And then you combine that with the economics, which Minister Malcolm X also touched on about who you trust to put, to nourish yourself, who you trust to prepare uh, and serve you food. Uh, that all should be factored in together. So we'll have uh, the commercial break and then we'll also uh, just revisit that segment from last uh, last summer if folks need any further motivation uh, with regards to uh, just being mindful and having the same vigilance uh, that we have about police brutality and some of the other issues that get discussed a lot when we talk about racism uh, as we are about what is on our plate uh, and what food options are made available to us under the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, this is from uh, the summer of 2013. We'll play the clip and then uh, we'll get a commercial break before we get back. Context of white supremacy. This is Tell Me More from NPR News. I'm Michelle Martin. In a few minutes, we will have a special treat for you. The sensational a cappella singing group Traces of Blue will be with us in studio. They'll tell us how they went from Howard University to the national spotlight, and they're going to sing. That's coming up. But first, if you don't mind, a couple of words from me about the events of this past week. As I was heading home the other day, I was thinking about a situation I encountered a while ago when I landed back in the D.C. area after a trip somewhere. I was hungry, and I saw that one of my favorite lunch spots had opened an outpost at the airport. So I ducked in there and was just about to order when I realized that a young woman standing next to me was having some sort of confrontation that was loud and getting louder. I turned to look at her. She was a big girl, as my parents would say, tall, stout, and she had on one of those wigs or weaves that, if you were having a mean moment, you might be asking yourself, why is she wearing that? And if you must know, she actually looked a little bit like a certain star witness in a recently concluded trial. So I had to decide what to do. I could have walked away and gotten my sandwich somewhere else, but I decided not to. I did the kind of thing that makes my husband, a former prosecutor, crazy, but I insist on doing anyway. I turned to her and I said, are you okay? Can I help? And you know what happened next? A big fat tear rolled down that girl's cheek and she ducked her head and she told me what had happened. Somebody behind the counter who was supposed to be making her sandwich had made fun of her hair and it hurt her feelings and she felt humiliated. And this is me talking now. She had no words for her hurt feelings, but she did have words for her anger. And so she started yelling. Can I just tell you, this is where we are right now. Now we have to choose. We can listen to the shouting or we can choose to see the tears. So if by now you've decided that the story of what happened between Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman is all just media hoo-ha, engineered by professional agitators who have nothing better to do, then you certainly have that choice. But you are choosing not to see the tears. You are choosing not to see the tears of parents and siblings and friends, your neighbors, maybe the guy in the cubicle next to yours, who see their loved ones threatened, hurt, and even killed, and then come to believe that those deaths count for nothing. We brought you a story last week that may explain even a piece of this. Jason Silverstein, a doctoral candidate at Harvard, wrote in Slate and told us about a university study demonstrating that people do not respond equally to the pain of others. Researchers actually showed this by analyzing the brain responses of subjects. They found when viewers saw white people receiving a painful stimulus, a needle prick say, their brains responded more dramatically than they did when the same thing happened to black people. He called it a racial empathy gap. And Silverstein wrote that the problem isn't just that people disregard the pain of black people. The problem is they think that pain isn't even felt. 
And yes, since I'm sure you want to know this, even black participants assumed that black people felt less pain than whites. Why would this be? Silverstein told us the research suggested that study participants assumed blacks are somehow impervious to pain because they felt so much of it. In his words, quote, because they are believed to be less sensitive to pain, black people are forced to endure more pain, unquote. I tell you this not to relitigate this painful trial that's just concluded. This is not a suggestion that we all leave our car doors unlocked and our handbags gaping wide when we leave the house. We've all developed our gut instincts for better or worse. But this is a plea to reconsider those gut instincts and what they are based on. Think about the conversation we'd be having right now if, instead of thinking, these punks always get away, a certain neighborhood watchman had stayed in his car with his gun tucked in his waistband and asked a teenager visiting an unfamiliar subdivision, are you okay? Can I help? And then he might have learned that a 17-year-old was trying to find his way back to his little brother armed with Skittles and iced tea instead of, well, we all know the rest. To tie a bow on the rest of my story, I asked for the manager of the sandwich place. I suggested he apologize to the young lady, which he did. I asked her if I could hug her, which I did. I told her she was beautiful no matter what anybody else thought. And you know what? She is. RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas, to Europe, to Australia, to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past, it is our current reality. Be informed, be globally informed, you should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design. That's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8067 or check us out online at TRI Multimedia. Multimedia.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Justice with the Cows Radio Program. If you want to learn about, understand, and counter racism, white supremacy, be sure not to miss a cow's episode. We keep them jammed, packed with constructive information to sharpen your use of words to help eliminate the system of racism, white supremacy, ASAP. Also, to be able to invest in my counter-racist efforts, co-hosting the cow's radio programs, please visit my blog, Just Do Justice Today, You're just saying just buckets and buckets of work. I got an uncle real crazy. My uncle B, 55 years old, hates white people, mad to a white lady. 
And he sit around going, you know, these crackers ain't shit. Except for Susan. <laughs> he tried to explain the whole thing to me one day. Say, yeah, 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 I got a white wife. I love her. She loved me. That's all that matter. But I tell you this, if a revolution ever come, I'll kill her first. <laughs> just to show these crackers how me finish. <laughs> Motherfucker, cracker ass, motherfucker, cracker. She cracker, motherfucker. What? Hey, hey, hi, honey. <laughs> motherfucker, cracker. I'll kill my cracker kid, too. <laughs> the cows. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, that segment will stick in my brain forever. Um, I, it's not a criticism of anyone. It's just... Uh, if anything, I'll say the same thing I said last summer when I played it originally, when I heard it originally. Uh, any sort of remark like that is a reminder. Uh, if you heard Minister Malcolm talk about the absurdity of someone calling you nigger this and nigger that and saying that they don't want you in their restaurant anyway because they don't serve niggers, uh, and then you demanding to go in and have them serve you a cup of coffee or anything from behind their counter, the absurdity of that, uh, that's what it reminded me of. And just our response, I mean, hey, <laughs> thank I, I made an error. I had a bad day. I wasn't thinking correctly. Thank you for getting my self-respect back on track. I will remove myself from this line, make sure that I never into your establishment again and make an effort to get as many other black people to also refrain from patronizing you ever. That would be, I think, operating out of self-respect uh, all the way around. Racism and being mindful about which what we put on our plates. For sure. Uh, if folks have uh, thoughts, things they would like to share uh, about the program, Definitely can make time for that. Uh, I also uh, think they released more audio with regards to what this whole brouhaha around Donald Sterling, the white owner of the uh, Los Angeles Clippers basketball team. Uh, they actually got blown out today. They lost a uh, huge loss. I was I was even thinking that they uh, tank and throw the game <laughs> on purpose. Um, the in my view. The incredibly significant, again, not as significant as Minister Malcolm. I don't want to overstate things. Not as significant as Minister Malcolm. Not as significant as Fannie Lou Hamer. Not as significant as Shirley Chisholm. But, you know, significant. Uh, the Clippers team, which is, I think, almost exclusively all black males. I think there are two white players on the team. Uh, Hito Turkoglu and uh, J.J. Redick. There are two the two white players that they have on the team, but everybody else is uh, a black person, I think, unless, you know, people have some different thoughts about Blake Griffin. But uh, the entire team did not wear the uh, warm-up suit with the Clippers logo on it. They literally removed their brand, uh, all of them, when they went on the court for warm-ups. And uh, this was a deliberate response. Uh, to racism they just wore plain uh, red shirts with nothing on it didn't say didn't have the logo nothing just uh, they totally removed their brand uh, in response to the owner the white owner's comments uh, it is I, I hear you loud and clear wow I was stunned I was stunned uh, again don't want to overstate it I mean you know but that did happen I thought it was significant um, if any of the folks had, had commentary related to the wonderful information that uh, Tracy McWhorter presented, uh, the folks who dialed in, uh, who had their hand up, line should be open. Yeah, I would just like to say oh, everybody should get that book, you know. Really enthusiastic lady, knowledgeable. We'll look into it some more. I agree. Here, here. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Be... Yes, ma we can yes, hear you. May I be heard, yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I, I would just like to add uh, one thing, and I was hoping that I could put it on while the sister was still on. Um, with regard to the soy issue, I do suggest that people do their research. Uh, from my research, I am made to understand that soy is a plant estrogen, or it's called a phytoestrogen. Estrogen is a female hormone. And one of my concerns, and I work in hospital settings, uh, work around babies as well, 
uh, is that a lot of our babies that are not being breastfed and they're giving them the stimulus, the infamil, some of these other formulas, the babies, when they cannot handle those formulas because those formulas are garbage, okay, they put them on soy. My concern is soy being in plant estrogen, what kind of effect that that is having on the very delicate hormonal balance in the body. I have a concern, especially for baby boys getting uh, soy milk as the only thing that they're doing for months and months. Uh, but I, I don't want to be up, you know, on the other side of what the sister is saying. What I am suggesting is that we continue to do our research and make decisions as far as the soy is concerned. I do work with people uh, from a nutritional standpoint, and the only one that I suggest uh, to do a lot of soy would be women that are postmenopausal that may need an extra estrogen boost. But it's not something that I suggest to the general public unless they're just going to do it in very small amounts. And I need my life. I, I definitely appreciate that and that I appreciated her response uh, when she talked about soy and saying saying the same thing that you did about, hey, this is one that you got to do research on. And that's a result of the confusion uh, that's been put out there where it can ha- kind of have people uh, not clear uh, about this product. But uh, I, I love that where she said, you know, do your own research. And if you conclude that it's not healthy, don't eat it. Uh, there's certainly a lot of a wealth of of other options uh, for vegetarians, vegans, uh, plant based eaters to consume. You don't have to have it. If you conclude that it's it's not the healthy way to go, then don't eat it. Uh, I thought that was fantastic as well. And and I have seen a lot of information about this. Uh, even people suggesting that this is a product that is used in abundance uh, for animal feed, and that they have so much of it, they have to figure out you know ways of. Uh, getting rid of it, basically. Uh, and so they came up with all these nutty products that she did even mention, uh, the soy pepperoni and all this other soy, you know, everything, <laughs> now soy chicken nuggets and all these other things, which she said is, is highly processed and uh, is not the healthiest option either. So um, definitely, I, I totally agree with your sentiment about we need to do more research. And if you conclude it's not healthy, don't eat it. Right on. Uh, I can also say, uh, being a dedicated uh, vegan for uh, about two years, uh, and I definitely enjoyed it and uh, look forward to, to going back and transitioning because I just I felt better and um, didn't miss anything, to be truthful. It, it, that's one thing that I can say for anyone who's thinking about making those changes to your diet. Your palate will change. Uh, the things that you enjoyed and thought were tasty as you transition and particularly as you get rid of a lot of the processed foods uh, that are just saturated with salt and sugar as you as you progress away from those items uh, what you think about food your interaction with food how it tastes uh, all of that will change. Uh, and I think even as the previous female caller mentioned, with all the toxins and things that are in food, as you transition to eating healthier, uh, your body will respond differently to the foods uh, that you eat. Uh, even if it's, you know, the first week or so, you know, you're complaining about it or you're noticing the difference. I mean, it is really much like withdrawal because they have so many uh, drugs and toxins in the food. But your palate will change uh, if you give it, Uh, I would say six months, and that's just long term. It might be quicker than that. But I I suspect that after six months, some of the things that you liked and thought were really wonderful and great, uh, they will not taste the same, particularly if you are really making an effort to eat healthier and getting away from a lot of the processed stuff. It won't taste the same. You won't have the same attraction to it. Uh, It'll just be overwhelmingly sweet uh, or overwhelmingly salty, uh, just you will change. Uh, your body is, is organic and changing uh, as you change your thought process, as you change what you consume, uh, your body responds. So it is a transition like anything else. It's not a overnight you go from eating a Big Mac to uh, 
uh, eating lentil soup. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work like that. It is a it is a process. Uh, but definitely, I think that's one where uh, we could make a huge blow against racism, white supremacy. Uh, if I mean, just imagine if it was known like black people were known for not eating eating at McDonald's. Black people were known for not eating fast food like that would be, you know, wonderful blow <laughs> against the system of racism. Um, if, uh, folks, unless they had, uh, other thoughts on the diet aspect, which is super important and, and hopefully we can be doing more programs on this. We can have Miss McWhorter back as well. Tracy, that would be awesome as well to, uh, read some more from her book. Uh, did anyone have anything else on this topic? All right. Um, I will go ahead and play the full audio. They released an extended version uh, of the uh, whole Donald Sterling incident, which is not the most important thing on the plantation, but it is generating uh, a lot of attention and making a lot of people who don't frequently talk about racism, now they're talking about racism. Uh, it's the middle of the NBA postseason, and they're having press conference after press conference uh, about racism. Uh, even Michael Jordan had to issue a statement uh, talking about this and condemning the racism. Again, LeBron James, I mean, a lot of people that you don't often hear talking about racism who have the attention for a lot of folks if you have children or grandchildren who are big time into sports, athletics, or even if you have older victims who are big time into sports and uh, talk about these folks, uh, these folks, as I said, Shaquille O'Neal, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Magic Johnson uh, have all been talking about this and talking about racism uh, in general uh, and even workplace racism, even some former players. And this this did stick out to me as very important some of the former players, black males who had been on the Clippers roster started to speak out about their experience working for him. And that's what it reminded me so much of workplace racism, how so many people, uh, when people come on and talk about things that have happened to them, a lot of people that never call in, but they will write and say that that happened to them too, that they went through the exact same thing. White people said the same thing or made the same type of racist jokes that it's not an isolated thing, that this is just uniform. This is consistent standard operating procedure amongst white people uh, on this planet dominated by racism. But some of the players are talking about how he would name call them and degrade them. Uh, and this is Baron Davis that I'm talking about for folks who follow. He did an interview. Uh, they just played a sample of it. It's supposed to come out, I think, on Tuesday where he talks about uh, his experience working for Donald Sterling and how he would call him uh, all kinds of names, profanities and curse at him. And um, I mean, just it, he said it got to the point where if Donald Sterling was present, it would adversely impact his ability to, to play uh, basketball because he would be so degrading uh, and calling him names and doing all this. And he said that it was systemic because the other people that worked there, they just went along with this because they didn't want to upset him. They didn't want to lose their job. So it was just an environment where everybody went along because the most powerful white person in charge, they didn't want to upset him. They didn't want to lose their spot on the plantation. So, and he said that they would uh, mimic and say these same types of degrading comments uh, to appease Donald Sterling. Uh, I'm waiting to get the full interview. It's supposed to be on Tuesday, but I am sure there are, I mean, he's had a lot of black players on his team. I am sure if they came out and talked about some of the things that they heard, some of the things that they saw, the way that he treated them, I am sure it would be a wealth of all kinds of this sort of tacky and trifling behavior. And that's the same thing I think it's consistent with most black people. If we just reflected on our workplace experiences with white people, it would be an astronomical indictment. And we would get to see how consistent a lot of their terror, uh, terroristic behaviors are in terms of them doing and saying very similar types of things. Uh, we'll go ahead and play the clip and see see what stands out. This is uh, reported to be Mr. Donald Sterling voicing his opinions and views about black people. I think there's some key words that get uh, brought out here. Uh, we'll just listen in and see if anything jumps out. Context of white supremacy. I'm sorry. Is there anything that I can do to make you feel better? No, you can never make me feel better. I'm sorry. You're just a fighter and you want to fight. And, you, and I'm not the man who wants to fight. 
I'm sorry, sweetie. Everything was okay and perfect. I'm just telling you, you told me you were going to remove it. So the dentist, the, the second dentist who looked at me, made that comment. You have a key? Yes. Okay, right now. Do you see parking for me? Is someone leaving? Just turn it on for me, Lucy. Yes. I'm sorry, honey. Can I get you a little bit more juice? I don't want to fight with you. Of course you do. You love to fight. I don't fight. That's all you do. You fight with everybody. I'm sorry to feel that way, honey. I don't know how this conversation even came about. You were telling me how people called you and how they mentioned certain things to you. And how it bothers you. Can't you say the few Instagrams I won't? I'll just... Here you go, honey. A little bit of juice, baby. A little bit of juice for you, honey. Thank you, Eddie. Honey, if it makes you happy, I will remove all of the black people from my Instagram. You said that before. You said I understand. I did remove the people that were independently on my Instagram that are black. Then why did you start saying that you didn't? You just said you didn't remove them. You didn't remove them. I didn't move Matt Kemp and Magic Johnson. Why? But I thought Matt Kemp is mixed and he was okay, just like me. Okay. He's lighter and whiter than me. <coughs> okay. I met his mother. You, and you think I'm a racist? And I don't think you're a racist. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I think you, you... Evil heart. I don't think so. I think you have an amazing heart, honey. I think the people around you have poisoned mind and have a way of thinking. It's the world. You go to Israel. The blacks are just treated like dogs. So do you have the, to treat them like that too? The white Jews. There's white Jews or black Jews. Do you understand? And are the black Jews less than the white Jews? A hundred percent, fifty, a hundred. And is that right? It is a question. We don't evaluate what's right and wrong. We live in a society. We live in a culture. We have to live within that culture. But shouldn't we take a stand for what's wrong and be the change and the difference? I, I don't want to change the culture because I can't. It's too big. But you can marble. change yourself. I don't want to change it. My girl can't do what I want. I don't want the girl. I'll find a girl that will do what I want. Believe me. I thought you were that girl. Because I try to do what you want. But you're not that girl. There's no need to get upset. No need to get... I just see what, what I'm living with, what I'm do, dealing with. I'm sorry, I didn't do anything. You, know, you never do anything and never anything wrong. But I didn't do you anything. Upset you upset me. I upset me. You made yourself upset. No, that's not true. You, you didn't start off by saying, honey, I understand we're living in a culture. We can't because I don't, culture. Just, I don't see your views. I, I wasn't raised the way you were raised. Well, then if, if you don't feel, don't come to my games. Don't bring black people and don't come. Do you know that you have a whole team that's black that plays for you? You just, do I know? I support them and give them food and clothes and cars and houses. Who gives it to them? Does someone else give it to them? Do I know what I, that I have? Who makes the game? Do I make the game or do they make the game? And these are 30 owners that created the league. Bring, I'm not going to bring any black people to the stadium. Well, is it easy to say that? It's very easy for you to say that. For you to say that? I, I won't say that to anyone. I would never ask anyone not to bring someone based on race or okay. color okay. or culture. Okay. It's like saying, like, 
Let's just persecute and kill all of the Jews. Oh, it's the same thing, right? Well, isn't it wrong? Wasn't it wrong then with the Holocaust? And you're Jewish. You understand you're, you're discrimination? You're really a mental case. The Holocaust we're comparing with... Racism. Uh, discrimination. No racism here. If you don't want to be walking into a basketball game with a certain person, is that racism? <sighs> Fascinating. Fascinating. Right here. Uh, I'm sure that they have different... Uh, versions of the tape and and longer ones and all that um i know i did the one where he called out magic johnson specifically and saying even him you know just don't be bringing him to the games and all that um it is fascinating um for me i would say one of the things that i would hope gets pulled out in all of this uh where people don't just focus on donald sterling but he seems to be saying that other presumably white people had been commenting to him about this as though, Hey, this is something that shouldn't be happening. Why are you allowing this? You need to do something about this. Did you know about this? Who are these white people? Exactly. I mean, if this guy is a billionaire, uh, these might be other, these might be other owners. These might be other employees of the Clippers organization. Who exactly are these other presumably white people that are making these comments to him? That would be interesting as well, because uh, it sounds like it's not just uh, Mr. Sterling who has these views. It sounds like there are others who share these views, uh, who, you know, brought this up as an issue to him. That would be one. Uh, just evaluating what I heard, the psychology that I heard in Mr. Sterling. As I've said, this, this to me almost sounds like when the white woman begins crying right like oh you're hurting me why are you doing this to me oh my gosh i thought we had this i mean very skilled we talk about that all the time their skill at playing the victim that i mean is huge and particularly that moment where he says you think i'm a racist you think i have an evil heart all oh, the the psychology of that her, her immediate response no no, I don't. No, I don't. Here, I'm bringing you some juice. I don't think you're a racist. I just think, and I think that's common too, uh, where the white is playing the victim. I will go ahead. You think I'm the worst. You think I'm Satan. Oh, you just think the worst is, oh, no, no, of course not. No, no, I definitely don't. I have seen that employed on a regular basis. It Generally, I hear that from white women, but uh, I'm glad that, okay, white men do this too playing the victim role when they talk to other black people. Uh, the moment where, when she's defending, it's right after that, where she's defending him and saying, no, I just think it's the way you were raised or the people that you're around. It's your culture. He interrupts her and says, it's the world. Oh, Hugely yeah. important. That And that's another one where people are trying to isolate and just say, oh, this is just some ignorant white man. He's just, I've heard that so many times, that he's ignorant. I've heard people try and get real eloquent talking about this and saying, oh, I think racism is the refuge of ignorance. No, this man is a billionaire. You cannot be a stupid billionaire. How do they think he got all this money and is managing all this money? And it's only, it's only 30 people who own a professional basketball team in the NBA. It's only 30. Are you telling me that you just allow stupid, ignorant people to own these billion dollar franchise and not just any franchise, a franchise in Los Angeles? No, man, I do not believe that at all. In my opinion, that that is totally incorrect comprehension of what was said. He was telling the truth. This is a white man that's not ignorant. This is a white man who is trying to tell you, hey, I understand racism. I understand the world in which we live. This disregard for black people, it's not just me. It's just not just my handful of friends. It's not just Frazier Glenn Miller. It's not just Cliven Bundy. This is the whole world. The next part where... Uh, he goes into details. I thought that was great. He could have listed off, rattled off a uh, bunch. When she starts saying, well, that's wrong. You know, you sh shouldn't it be about, you know, doing what's right? You know, we shouldn't be going along with that. And it says, hey, no, no, no. 
it's not about right and wrong. It's about accepting the world we have. And that I think that is Mr. Fuller's definition of refined racism, really all the way through, because you got a white person sexually suing a non-white person, which is a big part of the new strategy. And then that is consistent. I think even that's in the word reconciliation. We should just reconcile ourselves to this is the way of the world. Nothing can be done about it. So you just have to go along to get along in this system of white supremacy. And what that means is constantly putting down degrading individuals who are black, doing everything that you can to be associated with classified as a white person, racist, white supremacist, in my opinion. Uh, but I thought that was crucial. And I hear that all the time. I hear that even from a lot of non-white people. You can't change it. You just have to accept things the way that they are being racism, white supremacy. Uh, the next one, this is our culture. He said that as well. This is our culture. That is the culture that we are immersed in on the planet, meaning that's the way th people think and behave on a daily basis worldwide, all over the world. And I, even, I thought it was great to him breaking down and saying explicitly they're white Jews and black Jews because people, I think they get kind of reckless to me it might even be some confusion when they just go after saying that it's Jews you have a lot of individuals who are classified as black who are also Jews we've had some on this very program and those same people have said that hey I am a Jew and I'm a victim of racism because these white people who also say that they're Jews are mistreating us very important distinction that frequently gets lost I think when people get off and say oh it's it's Jewish supremacy you, you, you're talking about the system of white supremacy um when he talked, when he talked, when she said you have a whole team full of black players, which is mostly true. There are two white players, but whatever. Uh, he says, uh, don't you think I know that? I give them food. That was the first thing he said. I give them food. Now, he did go on to mention cars, houses, etc. But the first thing he mentioned, I give them food. Now, someone, I think, said on the program one or two weeks prior that white people think about us like their pets. You can be nice to that. I think someone, I don't quite remember, but someone said they can give you a lot of money. Blake Griffin is very well paid. Pretty much everyone on their roster. Chris Paul, doesn't matter. Bench to the starters. They are all very handsomely compensated non-white males on the plantation but <laughs> uh, they can give you a lot of money they can give you nice food I think I said that <laughs> a couple weeks ago I could be in error but I said they can do this but you're still a pet they might do this you see this all the time they will give the dog all kinds of treats and spend all kinds of money on the dog uh, maybe even take the dog on vacation with them I've seen that happen they have a little travel buggy uh, for, you know, Lassie or Rin Tin Tin or whomever they're, they're taking on the trip. I've seen white people do all kinds of extravagant things, particularly with their dogs. But that's still a dog. Just because I'm nice to Fido doesn't mean that I think Fido should run for president. That doesn't mean that Fido gets included when we make our family decisions. He doesn't have a vote. It is the dog. It is the pet. I am superior to the dog, even though I like Rufus. I might even kiss Rufus in the mouth, but Rufus is still the dog. That is the way white people think about black people. And in my, and I just, cynical African, he put the link on my page where it was just a report. This white person in the UK got in trouble because they had named their dog after a black football player, uh, i.e. soccer, uh, but he named his dog, Black Dog, after this black football player. And I said, I've seen this all the time. That's the way they think about us. Food. That was the first thing Mr. Sterling mentioned. I know I have black players on my team. Who gives them food? To me, that is not thinking about someone as an equal. That is not thinking about someone who's on your level. That's the way that I talk about a dog. That's the way that I talk about uh, an animal, something that I have on a leash. Uh, I will pause there. Uh, I think it just it reveals so much. And in my opinion, overwhelmingly, this is yet another illustration. When I say whites have created a racial hierarchy, the darker you are, if you are classified as black, 
you're going to be treated worse. That's just what they have set up worldwide. Uh, now, people say they don't agree and all this other. At the end of the day, I think that's accurate. And this would be yet another example of that being the case. She is not white. I haven't heard anyone who's saying that this, the female who's uh, in this recording, that she is a white person. They've said that she's mixed race or biracial or black and uh, Mexican or var- nothing. At no time have I heard her mentioned classified as white. It's you just aren't supposed to be associating with black people. She even justifies and says one of the people that she left on her Instagram, he has a white parent and a non-white parent. She said he's mixed, so he should be okay. He's whiter than I am. That right there, in my opinion, further evidence is the hierarchy. I could be in error, but, you know, uh, if folks have any other comments and or comments on uh, the response to all of this, uh, the Clippers players not literally removing their brand when they went out for warm-ups before the game. They had their jerseys inside out so you couldn't see the Clippers uh, logo. And then they also wore black armbands a la uh, Tommy Smith and Juan Carlos uh, from the uh, Olympics in 68. Uh, any thoughts on the audio? Anything that it, you know you feel like it revealed about racism, white supremacy, or the response today from the players? Have you heard? Yes, sir. Oh yeah, this, I think this is super historical. That 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 audio right there, that's gonna that's gonna cause a lot of stuff. Um, now this I ain't sitting there talking about uh, this black this black Jews and then there's white Jews and I think he said the black Jews get treated like crap or something like that. Um, and uh. Uh, his attitude. Uh, here's another example of uh, these people who are associated with the uh, the so-called sacred documents, the Bible, the scriptures, who call themselves Jews. It's like when she compared uh, what the Jews went through, how they were. Uh, treated unjustly and uh, persecuted because of uh, race and all that. It's like he, he, he's, he like basically said there's no comparison, basically. And it's like any time, um, the only time they represent the word of truth, righteousness, and justice um, is always from this white Jewish perspective. Okay. You know, it's just unbelievable that he could try to say that there's no comparison like that. And so it's like, say, and then he says it's the culture of the world. To me, what he's saying is like how y'all say the religion of this, the Babylonian world is white supremacy. That's the, that's the devilish concept that they into. And I, that's, that's enough for me, I think. Yeah. Any of the other folks have any comments? Yes, is it? Can I be heard? Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. We can hear you. Yes, um, I, I noticed uh, he, he kept calling her a girl. And coming from that slave master um, mindset, he said, yeah, oh, what do you mean do I know? He said, "He said I know, <laughs> meaning I ain't ignorant. He said, he know. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's saying. And that guilt complex came out when he said, oh, you think I'm a racist, don't you? You think I have an evil heart? Now I see that sounds like a projection or something. See, he, he know. He already know what's up. And I think she was, like, I want to say the most codified, but it was effective enough because during the whole recorded or recording, she was asking some hard-hitting questions. And, uh, like, when she he called her an enemy, um, that's, like, militaristic language. And she said, why or how am I your enemy? And he said, well, because you don't understand. 
And when it gets into that kind of talk, see, he, he knows what position he's in. And, you know, like what you said before, who are these people? Who, who called you? Who exactly is calling you? Now, it's got to be either somebody in some kind of high position or somebody that's coming to the games or something. And they said that his wife showed up to the game, you know, wearing all black. Now, that's a, you know, another thing that's interesting. Wearing the color black, I guess. I don't know what the significance of that is, but this is a, I guess this was his girlfriend. So was he, you know, cheating or what? I'll leave that, you know, for another day, but. Yeah, he was saying, you know, black Jews and white Jews, which really means that the, the Jewish thing, that's just the cause of confusion as well. So he still knows that he's basically a white person. And she was, she kept saying, I know she was a victim, but, you know, she wanted, she wished she could get rid of her color and her melanin. I met, I met the mother, meaning that some, I guess that father was a non-white person. Um, I guess his last name was Kemp, and he said Dennis. I don't know if he might have been talking about Dennis Rodman or maybe somebody else. But yeah, a lot of you know names and things like that were coming up, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy that. Well, not really happy, but I'm kind of. Um, I guess, excited that this audio came out because so many of us keep trying to avoid this issue. You know, even if you, like, are posted on Facebook or anything because this is involved in so many of our lives on an everyday basis, we turn on that TV and we enter that entertainment. You know, Real Housewives and BET, NBA, NFL, and it's like you can't be too quick to avoid this. A lot of people really been talking about it. So this is one of those things that will get victims talking about racism in some kind of way. They even got a statement from, you know, Michael Jordan and certain people. And, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to know what ends up happening to this guy. And I really wish that the other ones would come out. And I, and I want him to stand by what he said. Like, don't come out and apologize. And people are going to say, well, he's 70 something years old. It's, it's just this, it's just the old people doing it. They're going to die out soon. And they'll either put it under that or a KKK banner, Clive Bundy, or I mean, uh, Miller, or he's from the South. So they might put him in that bracket, and, and that's about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To that point about them, uh, to the point I raised about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, racists viewing black people as pets, animals, uh, he, when he was talking about white Jews and uh, black Jews, he said that the uh, black Jews are treated uh, treated like dogs. Uh, Bruce Fine uh-huh. pointed that out, which would just further enforce what I'm saying. That's how they that's how they view us, I think, um, and and that explains how they can end up sexually sewering a non-white person and still mistreating them. It's not about I see this person as an equal that I love and care about. It's, you know, hey, some white people do enjoy having sex with their dogs and horses and what have you. But that's still a horse. That doesn't mean that, for the most part, that doesn't mean that the horse is equal. The dog is equal. It's the dog. And I'm just, you know, sexually exploiting, uh, really, another being that is in a weak position. And that's the same way that they look at us. I am sexually exploiting another person who is in a weak position and vulnerable position, easily confused, easy to exploit, uh, and I can just do it sexually. It's the same thing. I think Pam has said that repeatedly. They, they view having sexual intercourse with black people as almost a kind of perverse form of bestiality in their mind, in their mind, because they don't see us as human beings. Um, any, any of the other folks uh, have any 
any thoughts or the players. Like I said, a lot of folks have responded. Magic Johnson uh, responded. Michael Jordan responded. Kobe Bryant responded, which even that stood out to me uh, because Kobe Bryant had just been criticized by a lot of black people for him saying that, you know, it can't always be about black and white. And I'm not going to support a Trayvon Martin just because he's a black person. And we got to be more into the details like that was that was like weeks ago. Uh, and he, people were very upset with him uh, about those comments. And then bang, now he's not saying, yeah, no way I could work for him. <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, it, I mean, it really, uh, if nothing else, got a lot of people who generally would not be commenting about racism, talking about racism. Uh, and even, I would say, I mean, the playoffs, this is like big money time uh, for white people that run the NBA, for them to have to devote this much time, like this was front page on the BBC. Like, uh, I mean, that's, to, they never, right on. they're never talking about uh, NBA issues uh, on their yeah. front page just because it's not, it's not happening on that continent, in that part of the world. But this was front page on the BBC, uh, this, this whole incident and the players uh, response to it. Um, yeah, I posted uh, a couple other reports on my Facebook page. I just showing the long history of this guy's racist behavior. And I, I think uh, Bruce Fine, she had also sent me the article saying that uh, uh, an attorney has apparently reported that that was uh, Donald Sterling's voice in the recording. I already concluded that just because in all of the reports, I have not seen a flat, that's not me. I think that would have been number one. Like that would have been, you know, that is not me. I didn't say that, you know, that that is, you know, a fabrication. I didn't hear any of that. All I heard was those views don't represent me and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't a clear. I didn't say that. That's not me. The fact that I never heard that, that was all I needed to know. Like uh, I just heard we're going to investigate. Uh, you know, that's not me. I love Magic Johnson. That's my friend. Yeah. I've heard all that before. White people are very good with words. And these are white people who can afford to bring in the best, what they call PR specialists. A lot of what they do is fashioning the use of words. Even it's as simple as no comment. We have nothing to say about this. <laughs> this matter is under review. And, you know, it would be important for us to comment. And that's it. Right to the point. They will be very effective, very precise with what you say which you don't say, even if that is, you know, the stance is you don't say anything. And that's that very, I think you're going to see extraordinary, extraordinarily skilled use of words. And really, I don't I mean, not that it matters on the plantation, but I would hope that the Clippers stay in the playoffs because the longer they're in the playoffs, the more this will have to be talked about uh, And right. with the way that the finals goes and all that, just the playoffs in general. The, the further it goes along, the more inten attention they focus because it gets closer to the championship, what this is all, you know, the hubbub is about. Uh, so this would have to be like the it would be just like the Super Bowl where the centerpiece becomes Richard Sherman and racism. It would be the same thing. And I think it would be on a much larger level because we're not just talking about the player. We're talking about the owner of the team making these comments with a black head coach no less and one of the more popular players in the league and blake griffin uh and his racial i, I mean man it would i hope they stay in <laughs> i don't i hope that he doesn't win because i'm and even that would be beneficial because i mean that i would think might hit the white chip of a lot of black people young black people particularly black men yeah. i think but if they win a championship and this guy with what he just, I mean, whoa, Magic Johnson is normally commentating at the finals. I mean, oh, my God, man, I wouldn't want to see him win. But my God, the opportunity, it would be, oh, I wouldn't put it on the same level as Trayvon Martin. But wow, that would be huge uh, if they stay and just how much this would have to be talked about with the finals it would be uh it would be an amazing opportunity for everyone to do a lot of work particularly talking to young people i know it's a lot of 30s and 40s and 50 year old victims who are into all of this but man you talk about an opportunity to really break down racism with your children Boop. <laughs> right there let's talk about what michael jordan said about this let's talk about what lebron james said about this what would you do if you were in this situation what, i mean oh man <laughs> incredible opportunity take advantage take advantage uh the longer they stay you got a layup i think to talk about racism a lot and immediate response anybody who says racism isn't a big deal it's not a problem immediate response and this is in my opinion is a great one because 
it's two of the big myths under white supremacy that white people who have sexual intercourse with black people are somehow working against races and certainly cannot be racist. Now you got an immediate example that everybody will recognize. That's not true because he even has in one of the audio clips, you can have sex with the black people. Just don't be bringing them around publicly. And that's exactly what Mr. Fuller says. All this is out behind closed doors. The biggest secret. That's exactly what Renitia Tate says in pieces of a puzzle. This is all hush hush covert, which again just shows the lack of of respect, the lack of regard, the lack of value for black life. Uh, and again, this being like bestiality, you don't advertise that you're sleeping with a horse for the most part. Same thing, same attitude, but great opportunity and a great refutation of that point that white people having sexual intercourse with uh, black people somehow is evidence that racism is going out of style. Uh, I think also this is a great illustration when people say, Oh, it's just poor white people or, you know, this is this is just people that don't have any money and, and they're ignorant. Well, this guy's a billionaire. He owns a basketball team. I don't think he's poor. I don't think this has anything to do with money at all. In my end, the reverse of that, he is mistreating a lot of black people who have a lot of money. If this was really about class, I mean, Magic Johnson would have to be in like the highest of the high if this is about class. Now, if this is about race, then I understand the problem. But he has tons of money. Even Magic Johnson didn't make the cut. That, in my opinion, would be another one. You put that in your folder when people say, I think it's about class, not race. Well, what was the deal with Magic Johnson? What was the deal with any black person? And that's, I mean, hey, Magic Johnson co-owns the die. He's another owner. He owns another team. He owns the, and I think the LA Dodgers, that franchise is worth more than the Clippers. I could be in error, but I think the Dodgers franchise, because I think they paid over a billion dollars uh, for that team. He's not the sole owner, but I think he's a, a major uh, stakeholder uh, in the Los Angeles Dollars uh, baseball team, Los Angeles Dodgers baseball team. Uh, if this fellow owner of a major league team in your same city, if he's not even cool, if we don't even want him hanging out, I mean, that that to me says everything that I ever want to hear about class. Um, if you needed another example, you know, file that one away, too. At any rate, um, we should be back, as I said, on Tuesday. Um, he, uh, We'll have two guests, one white male, one black male, one from South Africa, one from the U.K. Uh, we'll be hearing about the coming elections in South Africa. I played that sound clip this weekend. Uh, you've got the uh, blatantly white party with him running uh, for white rights and to get rid of affirmative action for black people. Sounds like I've heard that before, too. Uh, we'll be talking about that, addition to Madiba and some of the other things that are happening on the continent. Uh, and then we'll have the white male. Uh, he is an author. He's written several books on uh, zombies as racism. Very interesting, particularly with Walking Dead. And we talked about this as a metaphor for racism before, but he'll be on the program uh, Tuesday. Both of these are Tuesday. So this is uh, all early on Tuesday. Uh, 11 a.m. is the first program. Second, or it's too many times on so it's 2 p.m. Eastern 1 p.m. Central and 11 a.m. Pacific for program one and then program two will be also on Tuesday this coming Tuesday uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern 3 p.m. Central and 1 p.m. Pacific so it'll be much earlier than we normally broadcast because our guests are not uh, in the states but it should be interesting to uh, talk to white person uh, African from the continent. It should be uh, cool to get in for love talking to folks who are in different spot, uh, different parts of the world. Anywho, uh, if anybody had a quick sentence to get in before we uh, conclude. Um, yes, one quick thing. Uh, what was the, the representative from Alabama? Was it Alvin? Alvin Holmes. Uh, now, this reminds me of, you know, how uh, I think I seen a video about some white people came out and said that they were adopting um, black children and they appreciated them. It seems like when a, uh, when a victim, you know, calls out racism or something racist happens, I remember him saying on a video that, the, you know, the truth hurts and white people don't like me the truth. It's like they just take the damage control thing where they, you know, they try to put up this front and when I was saying today uh, at the game, or footage of the game, a whole bunch of white people holding up these signs saying, oh, there's no room for racism, and try, I guess, trying to hug on the, the nearest black neck that they see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, see, we're, we're going to be all right. Let's take a selfie. And I 
I got mine for it, you know. And you just gotta be in that mode. I think I'll have a lot of anxiety if I was in that environment. I'll be thinking, hey, you know, it could be you too. You probably would say it right on, you know, right in the back room. Mm -hmm. You just gotta have that mindset. It'll protect you. Absolutely. Absolutely. They did, of course. And I mean, this should be expected too. This is nothing where I don't get. upset <laughs> i just i expected uh they of course found a black person to come out and say that they don't think donald sterling is a racist um and that they feel sorry for mr sterling uh Coutinho mobley uh, he used to play for the uh, he used to play for the clippers and some other teams but he said he felt sorry for them uh it's pretty pretty kind of, I'm, I'm expecting they'll have somebody else because he's had a lot of uh, players uh, come through obviously uh, and play for his team. A lot of black players that are uh, relatively well known. Uh, it'll be very interesting as they come, and particularly as if they can get some of the players who are retired, who maybe have a little bit more leverage to speak out uh, freely because they're not, you know, currently looking to get on a team and make a roster and all that, and they might be a bit more financially stable uh, if they have already retired. Uh, but it would be very interesting uh, to hear, you know, what people might have to say uh, about that team. Um, just thinking of some of the, the folks that have come through there uh, and played on that team. Elton Brand, I know he's still uh, in the league. Uh, they've had quite a few folks. Uh, even Mark Jackson, who's the coach for the Golden State Warriors, they're playing right now. He used to play for the Clippers. Uh, so you might, uh, just as I said, it's a great opportunity, I think. You'll hear a lot of people who normally would not be publicly uh, discussing uh, racism, white supremacy. Uh, they are offering a word or two. So, you know, definitely make uh, make note and use this as an opportunity to talk with young people about racism. And uh, I think it'll just be more and more to evaluate and talk about as this goes on, particularly once they make a, a decision about how they're going to respond uh, to this guy, what they're going to do, what the punishment uh, punishment is going to be. That'll be another conversation as well. Um, at any rate, uh, I did. I even snickered. They were talking about uh, suspending him, and I thought, "Wow, I don't even know. I don't know what that means because he's not a player. Like, does that just mean that he would now have to be someplace else and watch the game? I mean, what? I don't even. <laughs> I don't even understand. I mean, most owners they don't go to every game anyway. So, yeah, I mean it. It will be very interesting to see what the uh, what the the reprimand is going to be when they come down with the reprimand. Uh, it will be very interesting, uh, and the longer they stay in the playoffs, I think this will be talked about even more. You got cowbells all over the place in this one too, <laughs> um, which should not be ignored. That should be discussed when you know this all gets processed. Doc Rivers, the black head coach for the team, is married to a white woman. Uh, and Blake Griffin has a white parent and a non-white parent and has been at the center of a lot of uh, conversation about racism and racial classifications. People saying, is he accepted as white? Is he accepted as black? They did a whole like 15 segment uh, on ESPN about this, I think two, three years ago. Uh, but that's been something that's been talked about a lot. Uh, Blake Griffin's uh, and the racial classification confusion. But there are a lot of cowbells all over the place uh, around this uh, around this whole incident, which should not be ignored in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that's central, in my opinion. Anywho, uh, we'll be back on Tuesday. First up, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we'll have back-to-back broadcasts. South Africa, United Kingdom, World System of White Terrorism. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning into the broadcast. Uh, Miss McWhorter, her book, again, By Any Greens Necessary. Uh, phenomenal work. I'm so pleased we could get her on the program. Uh, you can uh, get the book, and then you can also go and check her website, which is uh, the title of the book, By Any Greens Necessary.com. Uh, man, <laughs> a pleasure having her on the program, and I hope people will keep uh, her information in mind the next time you sit down at your dinner table or make a trip to the supermarket to uh, pick up your items and, and what you are putting your hands on uh, to go in that grocery shopping cart. That right there, big way that you can make a swing back against racism, white supremacy. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the broadcast. Uh, invest if you think the program is constructive. Racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com listener supported counter racist radio
hopefully, a constructive investment of your Sunday evening. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the participation. Uh, Creator, it has been time. Help us be mindful of everything we put in our bodies, even in this confusing environment where racists have made it purposely, deliberately difficult to nourish ourselves correctly, give us guidance, understanding that what we put in our mouths can also be a major component of our counter-racist offensive. Help every black person understand black culture should be about healthful eating, healthful existence. Help us get closer to the day when it is known black people do not eat fast food. We are about eating in the most healthful manner possible. Help us be patient with ourselves. Help us be patient with other victims and make sure that we always remember include and draw strength from our ancestors they are still with us helping us remain dedicated steadfast to our assignment replacing the system of white supremacy with a system of justice as soon as possible ashe it has been time context of white supremacy signing out thanks all for tuning in i'm a victim brother a victim. Uh, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.